Hello and welcome to the November 29th, 2023 meeting of the Amherst Conservation Commission. The time is 7.03. Uh, first on our agenda is chair reports. I have nothing, so I'm going to hand it over to Dave Zomek. I really, based on the uh, the number of items you have on your agenda, I am I really don't have any significant updates. So I'm happy to defer to Erin if she needs some time at at this point in your agenda. Thanks, Dave. Go ahead, Erin. Um, I'm just pulling Bruce in as a panelist. Um, yeah, so the first thing I wanted to share with everyone is that um, the, the town is starting to embark on the um, uh, updated open space and recreation plan. Uh, we've had a couple meetings amongst the planning department staff, um, conservation department staff, um, and there's some other um, applicable departments who are, are involved, um, sustainability, potentially diversity, equity, and inclusion, the recreation department. Um, so we're just right now sort of breaking up pieces, um, getting the things we can update now updated for the new version. And um, in the coming weeks, we're gonna be updating or creating a draft survey for the community. And the purpose of the survey is basically to, to survey the community to see what their sort of open space and recreation wants and needs are. Um, and that kind of guides the whole process of open space and recreation plan development. So we wanted to just, town staff wanted to keep applicable boards and committees um, in the loop that this was beginning. Um, we have to have a draft ready, I believe, by June of 2024. So it's going to be kind of fast and furious once we get the survey underway. Um, but just wanted to make sure everybody has an open invitation to participate. And in the survey portion or any portion you wish to. So if you have interest in um, being involved in any capacity, please let me know. And if the commission wants to be involved just as a as a committee in any sort of re official review of anything, um, you're welcome to, to do that as well, so. Okay, thanks, Erin. Um, two questions. One is how will this be distributed to the public? And two, how does the commission be involved if we so wish to be? Yeah, so great questions. Um, the first is there will be a digital survey. So something basically you follow a link and go in and fill out the survey. There'll also be a, um, a hard copy. So people who are not comfortable with, um, you know, using the computer to fill out the form or the, the survey can use a hard copy form to do that. And so we'll have both available. Um, the format for the digital version has not yet been determined. We're, we're kind of hashing that out right now. Um, but yeah, there'll be a version of both. And the second part of your question was how could the committee be involved? Um, we meet, we've been meeting every couple weeks. So, um, you know, if individual, like if we wanted to have like one member of the CONCOM attend some of the meetings, that would be possible, like as a um, liaison, and or um, if there were any instances where the commission wanted to have more direct involvement, we could put it on the a future agenda to kind of get an update. Um, Aaron, are... could I could I just jump in? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess I would say we're, you know, we're going to be more proactive than that in in terms of the commission's involvement, uh, both the rec commission as well as the con conservation commission's involvement. So. The survey is just, you know, uh, so first of all, this is, a, I think it's a seven year update. I think the the, the plan is seven years old. Is that right, Aaron? Um, so I think we, we bought a little time. Usually you have to do five year updates. Um, we've been doing these, oh my goodness, for over 20 years and they're a requirement of the state. I would encourage everybody on the commission to look at the current uh, uh, open space and recreation plan. And it makes us of course eligible for future grants from the state. But um, I think once the survey is done, I think this staff working group will come up with ways to Michelle's question about engagement. Um, and, I, and I like what Aaron said there, which is, I, I think we need to have this on your agenda uh, in, some, in some routine way. And members of the committee may come with Aaron and myself to do updates with you. And 
and we could set aside some parts of your agendas in the in the new year to devote to some of these sections and get your input. And likewise, we're going to go to the Recreation Commission and get their input. I think there's also a couple of required public meetings that will will have to have public forums on the open space and recreation plan, where we invite members of the community, members of committees and boards. The planning board typically takes a look at this as well. I imagine members of the council might want to take a look at it. So I think there's going to be, you know, pretty robust but efficient and um, timely uh, process to get this done. What is our goal for completion, Aaron? I don't have it off the top of my head. I think we're supposed to have a draft by June of 2024 okay. to submit to the state. So, so okay. we'll, we'll be coming to you and we'll be inviting you members of this this uh, commission, as well as the REC and planning board and, and other boards and committees, as Aaron said, DEI, to come and and talk about, you know, how we use recre uh, recreation and conservation areas, how the two mesh together or how they don't mesh to, uh, well together. So it's going to be an exciting process. So Thanks, Dave. Um, I guess I was just wondering about that, like, logistical distribution to the town public and, you know, like, is it Facebook? Is it what, like, what is the mechanism? Emails, um, whatever. But we, it sounds like we'll have time to discuss that. I think we'll also have an Engage Amherst page. Okay. Which we've used very effectively in the past. So, okay. Sounds yep. great. Okay. All right. Shall we move on to our fact agenda? Yeah. Do you want to jump into some other business? That way we can... Okay, uh, so our first hearing is at 7, 10. Plan management updates. Okay, other business. Bring it on. Oh, Bruce has a question. Go ahead, Bruce. Before I got in, did you approve the minutes? Let's Not consider yet. that other business and put it on the top of other business. <laughs> Approval of minutes. <laughs> um, all right, what are the minutes? 10, 25, 2023, looking for a motion or comments. Um, I think we already approved um, 10, 25, actually. Okay, um, that, I think that's, we're on, that's what's on my agenda. agenda. Oh, uh -huh. okay, that must have been a typo. Okay, 11, 8, 11, yes. 8. Yep, sorry about that. All right, given that. I move that we uh, approve the minutes from 11 8 2023 as drafted. I saw Alex maybe Sorry. on the second. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Jason on the motion, Alex on the second. Bruce? Yes, aye. Alex? Aye. Jason? Aye. And I'm an aye. Great. Um, so two items, um, on the agenda for, for other, other business, <laughs> um, first is a, uh, request for a minor administrative change. This is kind of, um, really, really administrative, but, um, recently we approved, uh, the substation upgrades on College Street, um, you may have noticed that Route 9 was closed while they were doing some of that work. Um, and there's two poles that are across from the substation, um, just east of Fort Hill Auto Body. And the replacement of those poles, um, they were originally going to just access by vehicle, but they're concerned now that doing that will cause some um, damage rutting um, to the ground around the tires and there's a lot of vegetation there so they'd like to just place timber matting um, to access the poles this is what i recommended to them during the hearing um, but they didn't think it was going to be necessary so it's mostly just to share with the commission that they are are um asking to uh to use timber matting for the construction of the um, or the replacement of the poles. And I can share a quick um, figure that shows this. They're, they already got approval from Natural Heritage to do this. Um, 
but this sort of orange hatch uh, indicates where they would put the timber matting to protect the ground while they did the pole replacements. So that's basically, they're just, it's it's kind of just a notification to us um, that they're, they'd like to use the matting. Um, the matting typically for, for Eversource is very common um, and it, in my experience causes relatively little by way of impacts. Um, so, okay. Thanks, Sarah. And Alex, you have a question? No. I was going to make a motion. Oh, Jason, you have a question? Um, no, I just have something more of a comment that I noticed that there's silt fence along that line um, on the opposite side, or on, on the side where the pole is. However, there doesn't appear to be any kind of sediment controls around disturbed area on the same side as the substation. And there's been some mud in the street and such. And uh, I would just like to uh, potentially put it out there that some sediment controls be installed or if they're done disturbing those little areas that erosion controls be installed. But I believe we approved that uh, some plantings are going to be going in there. So I know they got a little ways to go. So I would like that to be cleaned up. Yeah, it's really timely that you mentioned that, Jason, because I was I just called um, Chris LaRose from Eversource this morning and I just I'm going to stop. Um, sharing for just a second so I can see if Chris is on the call. I did notice that they did some cleanup um, this I morning. See, I see. I'm going to let oh, yeah. Chris, Chris in. Yeah, they did do some site Hi, cleanup this morning. Hi. Um, Sorry. Go for it. Yes. Uh, to, 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 to your point, Aaron, um, you know, I you'd called this morning. Uh, Jason, if you can kind of detail exactly what you're looking at but what what uh, um, what we did this morning uh they had been there's we installed some gravel base uh where the water drains from both the road and the substation area and ultimately filters kind of off uh the street and into the property towards the wetland uh that's taking a lot of cause street runoff as, as well as you know some of the surface water shed from the area um so those stones were getting ran over due to to vehicle um use and after you called me today i did go out there they reinforced uh the straw wattle uh in that area so they added a second layer and then they added gravel so um there will be vehicle traffic over it just because of the limited footprint of it they, they, there didn't seem to be a way to feasibly avoid that um, so what we did was add additional gravel and they're gonna the, make sure that that gravel area is raked out um and maintains kind of a healthy filtration system for any runoff. Um, but as far as erosion controls, Jason, that you were referring to, it sounds like your 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 concern was more the so the the roadside soils, like in the tree belt. Is that correct? Yeah, the parkway there between the road and the sidewalk. Okay, and and the concern would be that the soils are exposed soils are migrating toward the road, migrating toward the road, or migrating toward the uh, curb cuts for the driveway, and then into the road. Yeah. Okay. Or just being tracked out by vehicle traffic coming in and out of the site. Okay. We we have we have talked to them about cleaning it. I, I do plan um to go out to the site, Aaron. They they were doing active work in that area. So uh I have some pictures that they sent me at the end of the day. It was a like an HEIC file. I could not download it, so I did not send those over to you, but I am gonna go out tomorrow morning and take some pictures um of the work they they had added to it. And and I I have asked them to uh to make sure it's cleaned up um, at least at the end of every day, if there's if it's not feasible to avoid it uh, during the actual construction, um, and then especially during uh, inclement weather, which it sounds like we may have this this weekend. Um, but uh, for for the for the, I'm trying to picture the that roadside tree belt in my head to you know I know there is a curb in there now, so it does seem like it would be possible to put erosion controls wrapped around that. Um, off the top of my head, I, I, I you know, I, I, I can't exactly picture it um, if it, it, you know, if that hinders vehicle access, but it shouldn't. It should have the, the two entrance points. So, I mean, I think that's something we can certainly address in the field tomorrow and have them have them do and make sure that they clean up any any soils tracking into the road. And because that parking area is becoming so disturbed that uh, I guess you'd call it a kind of like a, a gravel drainage uh, more like a filtration area so any any water that did shed that should settle out in the uh in the stone and we did look on the the far side of the um 
the straw waddle and there there is no um sediment there doesn't appear to be any sediment that's actually overtopping or making its way through so it, it does appear to be doing its job in that regard but uh but yes yeah, uh, certainly for for road tracking we can uh, be more much more diligent thank you is that sufficient jason yeah let's look at the map again <laughs> Yeah, I think so. I think that would be fine. Um, it's hard to see on this exhibit, but yeah, it's it's essentially the parkway there in between the two driveway curb cuts. Okay, and it sounds like there's a, a quick timeline for this, yeah. Given other... Was that for Chris, Michelle? Yeah, it sounds like that's what Chris was saying, but um, I guess given what Chris was saying, I'm looking for a motion unless there's other comments from the commissioners. I see Bruce. Move to approve the minor administrative change outlined in correspondence dated 11 14 23 for the order of conditions DEP number 089 0682. I'll second that. Okay, Bruce on the motion, Jason on the second. Bruce? Aye. Alex? Aye. Jason? Aye. Nam and I. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the Thank next. You all. You're welcome. Thanks, um, Chris. The next item is request for certificate of compliance for Southeast Commons. Um, so let me just navigate back. Um, oops. There, some folks um, have been out to this site. We visited um, back in, gosh, I think it was in the summer. There was quite a bit of, um, I don't know why it always does this when I'm on a call. Um, there was quite a bit of um, issues, uh, quite a few issues when we were out there last time, but um, they have, sorry, it's going to be difficult for me to navigate to the photos um, while I'm sharing. stop sharing for a second um there was quite a few issues when we were out there with storm water um but we were able to get them to button everything up and they were able to stabilize it before winter um i am very much in favor of issuing this certificate of compliance for a variety of reasons um part of the reason that i'm um very eager to issue the certificate of compliance is because there is going to be a project across the street and when the project across the street has its permits filed, um, it's relying on the wetland delineation from this project, which is extremely inaccurate. Um, the wetlands that were included in the original wetland delineation do not accurately reflect what's on the ground today. And I don't know if that's a symptom of the wetland boundary changing or um, if it was just, you know, difficult to delineate. I'm not sure which, but until we issue a certificate of compliance, that original delineation is valid. The site is stable. We have a report from the engineer that the um, that the project was built in compliance. We have um, a property manager identified as well as a um, engineer who will be doing the um, regular inspections for the site. And I apologize that I am unable to pull up the pictures. They're not seeming to want to um, open on OneDrive for some reason. And it's, oh, there we go. Okay. Well, let's take Jason's comment while you're looking. Aaron, you, me Aaron, you mentioned that the project across the street, you want to get this uh, certificate of compliance approved because the project cross street relies on the wetland delineations for this project how will um approving this affect that project can you just um, expand upon that a little more yeah so as long as 
so when when somebody files a permit and a wetland delineation is approved as part of that permit, that per that delineation is valid for as long as that permit is valid. And so um, unless we specify during a, a permit review process that we're not approving the delineation, there is a presumption that the wetland delineation is the same. Um, and so as long as this permit is open and there's no certificate of compliance, the wetland delineation is presumed to still be accurate. Once the certificate of compliance is issued, then it basically means that the um, the, deter the delineation is no longer accurate and anybody who wants to do work in that um, you know, general vicinity of that wetland would have to delineate again, take a second look and start start fresh looking at the wetland boundary. This was one, I, there was a, a trash can with some rakes. Um, I can just ask them to remove that. When you say but, um, general vicinity, is it in the parcel? Is it, is there a specific buffer? Like what it, what is the criteria so, for the, yeah. The... So I don't have the site plan up right now to share with you, but what I can tell you is <clears throat> when the delineation, when you, when you look at the plan um, of where the wetlands are located, it basically shows the wetlands being located behind this um, uh, replication area. So in the woods behind the replication area, but the wetlands actually extend all the way out um, along this boundary. Um, and they actually, um, if you walk along Southeast Street, there's wetland along the entire boundary of Southeast Street. So basically the entire property boundary is is wet. And I've been in touch with um, Amherst College because a portion of the property that was you know delineated is Amherst College property. And they're, they've acknowledged that this whole area is wet. So um, yeah, it's just, this this um and i can try to draw but this this whole area over here is wet and according to the wetland delineation it's upland so that's why i'm concerned about it okay. any other yeah any other commissioner questions yeah bruce go ahead is there a way to show where the other project is going to be or is likely to be proposed to be? Um, you mean right now? Yeah, I mean, you were saying, well, there's there's a different a different project that might rely on the current delineation. Well, where is that? Um, it's right across the street. Across, so, all the way across the app, East Street. South East, East Street, yeah. right. And so why why the delineation is important is because, can you guys see my screen right now? No. No. Um, why this delineation is important is because, so if you can, it's, it's kind of difficult to, uh, let me see if I can, yeah. So like see these, these houses across the street here, that's where um, there would be a potential project. And um, yeah. if, if, if there was development on that side of the road, then that means that the buffer cast off of this wetland would cast across the street because um, the road is not 100 feet wide. And that would make the project across the street jurisdictional under the Wetland Protection Act versus if the wetland delineation is as it is today on this permit, um, it would not be jurisdictional. Um, and so it's really important that this permit be closed. As well as this, to be totally clear, the site is stable and the applicant really wants to just close out the permit. And there's at this point, no no reason to keep it open. It's It's been seated, it's totally stable. The work is finished. We have a certification from the engineer. So there's a lot of reasons for us to close this out. <clears throat> well, three of the four of us were out there with you that day so yes go ahead jason i just have a question about the picture photo six or zero eight two one five zero it appears either there's just some trash in the water or that there's like a filter fabric i don't know if that was wrapped around a pipe or something aaron can you 
yeah just what that is um the um <clears throat> so that that pipe was the outlet of it was protected um during the the final phases when before the stormwater system was brought offline or was brought online all of the um, catch basins in the roadway had silt sacks in them and the um, the um, outlet of the stormwater discharge had a, um, a filter bag around the the outlet portion and that I think was to prevent surcharge you know water dirty water washing back into the pipe um, it's frozen in there right now, so they can't take it out off the end of the pipe, but they they are eager to take that off. Um, but it's essentially like a, um, a filter bag at the um, outlet of the stormwater structure. Okay. I mean, I would be in favor of approving this provided, you know, on the condition that they remove that because that certainly, and, you know, and, and as long as you can confirm that all the other inlets have their BMPs removed. Yes, they do. Okay. Thanks, Jason. Okay, so second point you made is covered. First point you made can be done hopefully in the next week when it's over 40 degrees. Given that, looking for a motion. Let um, me just, let yeah. just add that language in. Yeah, um, sure. There's also- Pull the slide up. Yeah, I'll do that. Let me just type first. Um, there, there's also a number of ongoing conditions on this site, just so everyone's aware. Um, and so you'll, this this um, certificate will look a little different than previous ones where we just issue a complete certificate of compliance. And this is related to monitoring and um, ongoing maintenance of the site. Um, You guys can reword this however you want, but at least it's something on the um, motion. Sorry, Aaron, I have one other thing. There appears to be a few delineation stakes out there still around the um, reconstructed wetland. Are they going to be removing those as well? Delineation stakes. So if you zoom in on this, uh, sorry, the last one, I think it is. Um, Just the stakes with the pink plastic ribbon around them. So, um, you know, if you want them removed, we can. Um, <clears throat> and our, I'm having a hard time seeing it on my screen because I'm doing a, a, um, a screen share on my work computer, so it's a little difficult to zoom in. But if... Um, are you talking about around the perimeter of the replication area or are you talking yeah. about the wetland? Okay, so um, it's it's up to you guys whether you want those removed or not, but um, there, the, there are still ongoing conditions for monitoring of that replication area, and so having them remain wouldn't be such a bad idea at this point because it would just help them to um, be able to monitor the... Um, extent of the replication area for for another year um but it's completely your call if you want to have them pulled out at this point um no, i'm fine with that if that's why they're remaining yep okay sounds good so we're looking for a motion <clears throat> all right i move to issue a certificate of compliance for dep number 089-0644 and local NOI 18-1480 with ongoing conditions state SC number 10, SC number 11, SC number 20, SC number 23, SC number 27, SC number 28, SC number 29, SC number 30, SC number 31, ongoing conditions local bylaw 21, 23, 24, 27 attached to uh, COC inspector and property management contact information, conditional approval on the filter bag being removed from the discharge pipe. 
Nice. Okay. Jason on the motion. Second. Alex on the second. Bruce. Aye. Alex. Aye. Jason. Aye. And I'm an aye. Great other business out of the way. Let's move on to our first hearing of the night. Okay, before we go, general procedures. Each hearing has 20 dedicated minutes. We're going to stick hard and fast to this one, given the number of hearings we have today. Um, five minute presentation by staff, followed by five minutes from applicant, five minutes total for public comment, or two minutes for a person depending on how many people we have, five minutes for conservation commissioners' comments. Um, again, all plan revisions are required by the Wednesday a week prior to the meeting at noon. And for all presenters, clear, please clearly state your name, your address of the project and who you're representing as well as, as preferred, preferred pronouns. Okay. Um, This, okay, so can you pull up our first one? Okay, so we have this hearing is being called as required by the provisions of chapter 131, section 40 of the general bylaws of the Commonwealth and act relative to the protection of the wetlands as most recently amended in article 3.31 wetlands protection under the town Amherst general bylaws. And this is for stone notice of intent for Stonefield Engineering and Design LLC on behalf of the Valley community development for the construction of 15 residential duplex structures and associated site work, including parking utilities, stormwater management, and landscaping within the buffer zone at 20 to 40 ball lane map 5A lot 56. And who do we have representing today? I see Josh Klein. I'm bringing you in. Hi, Josh. there's anyone else that wants to come yeah if anyone else is here for that raise your hand please hi josh welcome hello thank you for having us great so we're going to give aaron five minutes and then we'll move to you hi jessica i see i see you in there also anyway take it away yeah um so Everyone probably saw my memo with comments. Um, these were sent to the applicants. Um, I, I don't wanna go into all of the comments. I'd like to um, sort of uh, uh, give my time to the applicant to um, present the project and also potentially respond to my comments um, because everybody can read my comments online and um, <clears throat> If, if anyone has any questions about, uh, you know, the comments that I've made, I'm happy to address them. I will say that we didn't get responses to the comments until tonight, um, but hopefully Josh can can touch on that a little bit and we can figure out moving forward how to deal with revisions. Thanks, Aaron. Dave? Sure, I just wanted to, before this, uh, before uh, Josh uh, jumps in and Jessica, I just want to say, um, I'm going to recuse myself from this entire conversation and this entire hearing because my my family actually owns property across the street from this proposed project. So I'm going to kind of turn off my camera and won't respond to any questions. So please, if there are any questions, obviously direct them toward Aaron. But I will not be. I will just take myself out of this uh, this hearing and this conversation. Okay. Okay. Thanks for letting us know, Dave. All right, Josh, Jessica, do you want to take five minutes for a presentation? Uh, perfect. Yeah, I can get it started. Uh, uh, good evening. My name is Josh Klein. I'm a partner with Stonefield Engineering and Design. I am a licensed um, engineer in the state of Mass, as well as I think about 13 other states uh, throughout the East Coast. Um, we are here tonight kind of representing Valley Community Development, and I'm going to share my screen on the development as well. It's it's at the corner of Montague Road and Pulpit Hill Road. Um, the parcel, the address we've been using is 20-40 Ball Lane, and that's on the plans as well. So I am going to try to keep things brief and then use a little bit of time to talk about some of the comments um, as well. But what I'm sharing here on the screen, this is uh, like an, an aerial overlay exhibit. I think it's helpful because it shows kind of the site plan improvements 
and the grading, because again, we're we're incorporating above ground BMPs as part of the project uh, to meet the stormwater management requirements. So the contours, I think, will help us see those areas. Um, and then the aerial, I think, helps us maybe visualize a little bit better for, for those that were not out with us the other day when we did the site walk. Um, so I am gonna kind of zoom in a little bit. So we've kind of, we're looking at two different resource areas. We have a kind of a wetland ditch along Pul Pulpit Hill Road, uh, probably an old stormwater ditch that through, you know, kind of, um, you know, not being maintained over time has kind of grown into this, this wetland ditch that helps kind of convey water from the site to a, a DOT inlet at the corner. The DOT inlet, I did a little bit more research since our field visit, does connect to another DOT inlet across the street. And then we believe it actually discharges to a stream kind of under a bridge in Montague Road. Um, and then we have another resource area. There's a kind of a stream that runs along the back of the site. Um, as you kind of, you can see, I'll zoom in a little bit. It's kind of down the hill near the back of the property as well. So, um, you know, both resource areas are shown on the plan with a 50 foot no work work area, a 75 foot building setback and a hundred foot buffer. Just to kind of clarify the improvements a little bit. So the the kind of wetland ditch at the top of the screen, the only disturbance proposed, um, you know, with is within the hundred foot buffer. Uh, so no disturbances with within 75 feet of the feature. There's a slight parking encroachment that I'm highlighting on the right hand side of the screen. And then kind of majority of the you know, disturbance is really associated with kind of regrading the stormwater management feature towards the front of the site. So kind of one of the strategies or mitigation, you know, measures of this design was really looking to minimize disturbance, you know, kind of along the front of the site and kind of along this wetland ditch area. So we're kind of protecting the existing vegetation in, in this area that I'm highlighting between the stormwater basin and the parking. Um, we're protecting the mature trees and vegetation that you can kind of see in darker colors that I'm circling here. Um, and again, the, the site really today all drains towards this corner. So kind of this is that kind of the ideal location to put a stormwater management facility without kind of significantly having to, you know, impact the rest of the, the surrounding site. Um, so the stormwater management facility, it's an infiltration basin. We've done significant, we've done two rounds of, of testing on site to ensure proper groundwater separation as well as infiltration of the system. And we are fully capturing and infiltrating the 100 year storm event. So this, you know, this application goes, you know, well above and beyond the stormwater requirements set by um, the Mass DEP. Um, and so again, the, you know, the majority of the water uh, will run off into the stormwater facility, kind of the main one that I'm highlighting and be infiltrated into the ground. And then there's a smaller infiltration system uh, along the Montague Road driveway, just to collect a portion of the driveway, um, you know, due to the grade change. You know, it's it's hard to see see without zooming in, but you can kind of see the corners at elevation 185. And for reference, the back of the sites are around elevation 206. So there's there's a significant amount of grade change on the site, which makes kind of the design and implementation of the of the site, you know, a little bit challenging. Now, kind of working our way to the wetland feature in the back of the site. Uh, so there's no parking facilities that are located within the buffer. So we're only encroaching within the the 100 foot buffer. Again, no encroachment within the 75 foot. And this is just to allow for some of the backyards for these homes, as well as uh, there's a couple patio areas or a few that kind of encroach within um, that 100 foot buffer. Um, I think one of the other things to note is that you know, the areas where we're disturbing are areas that have been previously disturbed. So these are, you know, areas that have been farmed and cultivated over time. So this, these are kind of the natural mature vegetation that, the you know, that we're coming in and, and, and removing. Um, these are areas that, you know, over time have been cultivated, have been used for agriculture. There's clear signs of disturbance in them. And then in one of the other kind of mitigation strategies we're going to be incorporating will be Kind of going in and, and we found there's some debris within some of these buffer areas um, and we would be kind of removing any debris or trash there was some construction materials and you know kind of old debris so that would be something that you know, the applicant would like to do kind of both for both wetland resource areas is kind of clean that debris out um we aren't we aren't because it's a comprehensive permit application we're not subject to the kind of to the wetland um bylaw bylaw, but we did want to kind of highlight some of the disturbance summaries. So um, 
In total, we're disturbing less than 20% of the buffer zones on site, 17.1% uh, to give kind of an exact number. Uh, and that's even a conservative number because that excludes this property here. So as part of the you know, comprehensive permit, we are going to be doing an A&R to kind of subdivide the existing single family home. So those calculations exclude kind of the single family home, which is not being disturbed as part of the project and just includes kind of where the the kind of affordable housing development will be proposed. Um, so again, we're proposing in terms of buffer zone disturbance, 11.1 percent along pul Pulpit Hill Road. Um, and then if you include the, the, the single family home, it's 14.4 percent. If you exclude that lot area, it is 25 percent. But then again, overall, we're at 17 percent. Um, we did have a chance. We went through um, all of the comments and provided some feedback. I think the key is we we have no issue complying or in some instances, I think it just requires working with staff to ensure compliance with any applicable comment. Um, a lot of the comments, you know, I think are kind of technical in nature and probably something we would see as part of the stormwater management review in the ZBA process as well, you know, kind of final design of, um, you know, um, stormwater basin kind of technicalities, whether we're going to do, um, you know, riprap sides on the floor bay versus a grass bottom. But again, we've, we have no issue kind of complying with any of the suggestions that were made by staff. Uh, we did provide some feedback on some items that, um, you know, that kind of what the design process is, because it is, it's definitely, you know, from a stormwater perspective, something that we don't see all the time. You know, a lot of, a lot of practices will kind of discharge or let water kind of go out throughout falls, where in this case, you know, we are capturing and infiltrating the, the water into the ground, um, which is kind of a nice, um, a nice kind of design practice here. And then, you know, we would kind of work and ensure that there's a final SWIP, um, you know, on file and that's provided prior to any work being being completed. So I don't know if Aaron, there was any comment in particular you think it would be helpful for us to like talk about with the commission. Um, again, like I said, we would, you know, you kind of, I noted in there, we'd comply with all of them or I provided you a little bit, I think of feedback on any that needed it, but you no, know, for overall, we think this is a great project. We're excited to be here. We're excited to kind of continue the process. Aaron, you're muted. Sorry. Thank you. Um, there is one comment I just wanted to make sure I was that um, was a little bit more um, clear to people, which is this project is a little different than basically any project that's been before the Conservation Commission um, in my tenure, which is that it's being filed um, under 40B as a comprehensive permit application. And if you read the memo um, that I drafted, I just, this was a point of clarity for the commission, especially for new members who might not be familiar with the 40B process, is that when an applicant files under 40B, it's for um, affordable housing. And so they're filing a comprehensive permit application. And because of that, under state law, um, they have this certain um, exemption that they qualify for under state law, which means that um, the zoning board can review the project under all local by all local um, ordinances, which are more strict than state law. So in this particular situation, the Conservation Commission can only review this under the Wetland Protection Act um, and the zoning board would review. And that's my understanding. Uh, but, you know, uh, this is also new to me, but uh, the, the zoning board would review it for compliance under our local bylaw. That's my understanding. So I just wanted to make sure that commissioners were clear on Thank that. Thank you, Ryan. That's important. Okay. Any commissioner comments, questions? Bruce. Well, I have two. Um, one for Aaron. Um, would you say, based on what we know now, that they, if they were under the, the town's wetland bylaw, would they still be complying? Yeah, so they're yeah. they're under twenty percent alteration, and under our bylaw, we do allow up to up to twenty percent, and they're they're under the twenty percent of the bylaw alteration. They're also staying out of the fifty foot no disturb. So, right. um, I, I don't think that there is anything proposed here which would be non-compliant under our local bylaw. Okay, the second one is for Josh. 
Uh, could you just comment very briefly on, we spent a lot of time on the site visit talking about invasive species and getting rid of them. Um, could you just comment on that for a moment? Yes, yeah, so there in the in the back of the, the site, there was um, some kind of, you know, Japanese knotwood that was kind of located. So I know talking with um, Valley CDC and, and Jess is here, you know, if the, you know, if that would be something the board would like to see as a mitigation strategy for us to kind of, you know, do our best to control it and kind of provide the necessary treatment for that species, um, they would be something they would agree as a mitigation strategy for the project. Thank you. Um, I'll take public comment in a second. I just wanted to follow up on Ruth. Okay, I see Jason. I'm just going to go with you next. Go ahead, Jason. Here's Sorry, Jason. Josh, I have a real quick question for you. Up in the northeast corner of the project, that parking lot, if you zoom in, the grade appears to go 202, 201, 202. Is that in that low point? How is the water getting back to that corner then? Where yeah, I think it's it's. I think when we converted the overlay, it's just a typo. It's probably it's 200, 201, 202. You can kind of see here's a 200 contour, so it's pretty close to what's out there today. But all the water is draining down. There's an inlet. Mm -hmm. in, you can see the grate. Yeah. Okay. So, so and that then that water makes it spot. Part of this. Yeah, not a low spot. Looks like just a typo in a contour line. All right. Thanks, Jason. Good mm -hmm. observation. Um, so my understanding is that in the southeast corner, continuing on past that 100 foot buffer is a significant wetland and vernal pool complex that continues to um, the Puffers Pond, the Mill River. Um, and I guess I'm just mentioning this because we're in the hundred foot buffer there. And I understand that the the our commission really doesn't have jurisdiction at this point, but is this the area where you're proposing potential mitigation for knotweed? Correct. So this this area is where we're kind of focusing a lot of the the mitigation strategy. So both for the the knotweed as well as uh, this is where the most amount of trash and debris is. Um, if you kind of walk into this area, which is a little difficult to, you know, there's tires, there's rail ties, wood, um, all throughout here. So it, it's one of the nice kind of strategies of this project is kind of going in this corridor and being able to kind of clean it up um, and kind of get a lot of that debris out of there as well as the invasive species. I guess I'm um, just hesitant about um, not weed remediation without like very specific plans because it's so pervasive and invasive and very, very hard to control in riverine systems, which this is in sort of a system here. So we can talk about that more offline, but um, if there's, yeah, I mean, I guess that's the the primary invasive species you're talking about down there is just Japanese dotweed. Correct. Well, if anybody on the commission has visited the site and has any comments on this, um, I'd love to hear them, but um, maybe we can just talk more about that later um, in terms of specifics on remediation and the knotweed and it, it doing it in just one specific area where it's surrounded by other knotweed is probably not going to be successful. So um, we might have to have like a deeper conversation about what the expectation is and what the kind of treatment is about that. But very much interested to anybody who's been there to have any other ideas on it. Well, I, I was on the side visit and I don't know that I have other comments about knotweed. Um, you're right that there's a lot of it, and but the stream and the whole wetland saw is a fairly steep slope, and it looked like you they're gonna improve the situation within our the area that we're concerned about a lot. Um, the storm retention pond up in the upper left 
is going to be a probably a wonderful open grassy um, area for recreation and most of the time in, unless it, there is a storm. So it seemed pretty reasonable um, the way it was being described and and the the, uh, the plan that they had envisioned. Okay, thanks, Bruce, for the insight. Um, all right, so public comment, please raise your hand if you have anything. I'm not seeing any raised hands. Um, considering that there may be none, I think, are we still looking? What are we looking at, Aaron? Bruce, I see your hand up. Um, how do we address the person who's on the phone? How do we know that they want to speak or when they want to speak? And I do see a hand up for I Lauren. Do, I do now see a, a yeah, okay. hand up. All right. All right, Lawrence. You're... Thank you very much. I'm in a butter. Uh, I have not weed in my uh, uh, part of the ditch. Uh, it serves a function. It, it is holding the ditch uh, together. Uh, and uh, so I want to, uh, I've fought not weed. <laughs> Uh, for 30 years being here, and I've come to peace with it, and so that's <laughs> my feel oh about not weed. It's uh, it it's doing a good job. Uh, so, uh, and uh, uh, I want to express the grief of uh, change, uh, and I want to point out the wildlife corridor of all kinds of uh, animal life comes through. Uh, this ditch, uh, this uh, which is on the map called Mill River, uh, this is uh, this is a wildlife corridor. And uh, please, what I don't know the business, but please respect that and please help it. Uh, and uh, the mitigation and the seventeen percent of uh, uh, disturbance—it's all hurt. Uh, and the uh, the farmers who farmed this property uh, were uh, they were very good at uh, what was good for the property. Try to listen to them, and uh, 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 thank you uh, all of you for staying up late. For me, it's late, and uh, trying to do good. I'm, I'm very grateful, and I I have comments. I'm sorry, David Zomik the neighbor left the, the i understand but i'm sorry his input would be valuable if you could talk to him privately and uh, i'm concerned about lighting affecting the wildlife corridor and uh, the allowing the animals that come through to continue to come through they're going to the river uh, from the hill and uh, uh, i I don't know how, I'm not a public speaker. I don't know how to do this, but thank you very much for being there to uh, take input. And uh, uh, I, I, I don't know what to do. And I, I'm i leaving it to you guys to figure out. Uh, there you have, that's my two minutes. And I'll try to get off now. It's very hard to, I'm sorry about people who don't have this technology and don't know how to do this. I have a struggle with this uh, communications way and uh, uh i'm gonna go i'm gonna try to get off now I'll, i'm gonna try to meet bless you for doing good i'm very grateful and thank you for speaking up aaron for the not weed there's lots of stuff over there that's been used over the years and clean that out that's good and but i'm very hesitant about deciding what's what's good plant life this has been working for a long, long time, respect its knowledge, the knowledge of the plant life, life that's there. Thank you all. I, I really do sincerely appreciate your doing good for uh, people. I'm going to try to get off now. Thank you, Lawrence. Appreciate it. Um, any other public comment? Raise your hands, please. Um, yeah, just to reply to Lawrence quickly. So our jurisdiction is the wetlands. We're talking about remediation on the knotweed. Knotweed provides cover, but is very low in supporting biodiversity. Very, very low. 
um, unless it's a honeybee, which is not even a native species. So I'm in favor of removing knotweed with the caveat that it's very, very hard to do, sometimes not very successful, and there has to be a very good plan about what to replace it with. Um, and I totally hear you about the wildlife corridor. So, um, you know, hearing that, Aaron and Josh, I don't know if you have any comments about supporting that in the 17% and maybe not is the time to consider that. But um, yeah, if you want to reply to the public comment, go ahead. So the one thing I would say, I mean, obviously there there's an interruption in the in the corridor between Pulpit Hill Road and that wetland. Um, but I understand from the applicant that they are making an effort to create sort of a, a natural meadow, a pollinator meadow um, on the front of the property in the strip between the sort of parking lots in the homes um, and the um, stormwater feature. So I do think that that pollinator habitat will provide some wildlife benefit. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously there there are going to be impacts to wildlife, but that I think that that is a is a positive, a net positive to have that pollinator meadow um, consideration in there. Sarah. Yeah, I think that was a a one of a great point. I mean, there's a lot of different facets of the project. I mean, the project's in, incorporating kind of no mow type grasses, so kind of longer grasses that require less maintenance that support, um, you know, wildlife and provide a better natural vegetation. There's the kind of uh, pollinator meadows that are being maintained on site, kind of looking to clean up these buffer areas. I think we want to be careful with some of the items like lighting and things like that. You know, I'm happy to talk in depth about them, but lighting won't be an impact. I mean, this is a residential community. Lights are dark sky, um, I think certified is the technical term fixtures. Um, everything is downward facing, it's low, it's internal to that pedestrian corridor. There's, there's gonna be no lighting impacts, you know, kind of back back here. Um, and then I think, you know, what we really have to look at is, is a lot of the positives about this community. We wanna be careful, right? This is an affordable community. So you know, we don't wanna, you know, put the community in a position that they're gonna be in this endless fight that's, you know, so costly that, you know, it, it doesn't, have enough benefit, you know, I think what we have to keep in mind here is, is a lot of those the good things this project's introducing, you know, I think, you know, we, we're not going to be bringing in bobcats and, and things down into this ditch. I think the idea would try to be able to minimize disturbance, but let's get some of the trash out of there. I mean, there's been trash, there's visible, you know, when you walk in this quarter, you can see there's visible trash that's sitting on, you know, in the ditch that someone could easily walk in there and, and pull out by hand. There's tires that someone could easily get out with a wheelbarrow and all these things that I think inhibit, you know, wildlife movement, even within, you know, the, the buffer that's currently there um, that this project will be able to eliminate. So, you know, I think we're, we want to work with the city and staff and, and the commission on, you know, the best way to treat the knotwood. And our, our hope would be that, you know, we could agree to kind of do it in a, in a plan of action that would be approved, you know, by the commission and by staff, but, you know, obviously the, the request would have to be reasonable. Um, you know, we wouldn't want to, you know, put the community again at Valley. And if, if anyone's curious, you can kind of listen into the different ZBA meetings. You know, Valley, you know, eventually, you know, moves their way out of um, this project. And these these are homes. These are homes for um, people of color and, and affordable homes. So we want to make sure that what we're doing here tonight you know, sets up these families for success um, and make sure that we don't kind of put this community in a position that for the next 30 years, they're, you know, endlessly fighting a problem that we know exists in the area. And we know, you know, I think we all want to put our best foot forward on. So happy to go into any other items in depth, but, you know, we always appreciate kind of concern. And, and I, you know, one of the really nice things about the project is the amount of time that Jess and Valley has spent, you know, communicating with neighbors and, and city and staff and experts to kind of get to the point we are at tonight. Thanks, Josh. Um, okay, well, we've heard from the butters. Um, maybe that can be a conversation moving forward. And with that, so we're looking to continue this given some questions regarding the NOI. So commissioners looking for a motion. 
The motion says to continue it to 735 on 1129. Not that. <laughs> How about that? All right. I move to continue the public hearing for 20 through 40 Ball Lane NOI to 735 p.m. on 12 13 23. Based on the motion. Second. Bruce on the second. Bruce. Aye. Jason. Aye. Alex. Aye. And I'm an aye. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Jessica. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you so much. Okay, next up, we have SLR International. So this hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth and Act Relative to the Protection of Wetlands, as most recently amended in Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst Bylaws. This is a notice of intent for SLR International Corporation on behalf of the Amherst Associates, LLC, and the including work within buffer zone bank and under and land under water bodies and waterways at 370 Northampton Road, map 13D lot 18A. And do we have a representative here tonight? Um, please raise your hand unless Aaron, you can pull them in. I see no hands raised, so. There was one. Oh, there is one. Someone's in. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna do. Hi, Heather. Hello. I can't. Hi, can't see you. But um, we're gonna do five minutes from staff, then five minute presentation from you, and then we're gonna take public comment and have comments from commissioners. We're gonna try and keep this to twenty minutes because we have a very packed agenda. So I'm gonna give it to Aaron. Give us the lowdown. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah. So similar to the last um, application, I did submit um, a list of comments and questions to the applicant or the applicant's representative. Um, the applicant's representative was actually able to respond um, and addressed all of my questions. Um, they provided responses to DEP questions, responses to my questions, as well as um, plan revisions. Um, so I did have an opportunity to review those revisions prior to the meeting, and I was satisfied with those revisions. So I just wanted to stay that, state that um, at the outset. Um, obviously want to give the applicant an opportunity to um, present the project and explain things. Um, but from a staff perspective, um, I just wanted to state this. This project was constructed in the 1970s. There are stormwater features on this site which have not been historically maintained and that has resulted in adverse impacts to the resource area where these um, stormwater features discharge. I do think that what's proposed here is going to provide a net benefit to the resource area. Um, replacing some stormwater structures so that there is some level of treatment and also removing sediment that's been discharged into the wetland for decades um, and restoring the area and stabilizing it. Um, I think those will all be net benefits to the resource area. Um, my only sort of comment or, or words of urging for the property managers or owners are that there are additional failed stormwater systems and structures on this site which I don't think can be ignored. So while I do think that what's, what um, the applicant's representative has done to come up with a solution to the issue and try to improve the situation is going to be a net benefit, I think there are additional net benefits that could be gained by addressing some of the other failed stormwater infrastructure on the site. Um, so that's what I have to say. Thanks, Aaron. Heather, Mike, do you want to present five minutes? All right, I'm going to share my screen, just pull some plans up. Okay. So the, um, my name is Heather Minot. I'm an engineer with SLR. Um, Mike Gagnon, also on the call, is also from SLR. Um, so we were, our purpose in this project is to help alleviate some flooding that's occurring in this building right here in the basement. So we came up with some stormwater improvements to try and alleviate that um, and also improve some of the um, stormwater 
um, outlets into this wetland system right here. Um, so as part of the project, um, one part of it is to remove the accumulated sediment um, in this area right here, um, which is at the current outlet from this catch basin up here. Um, so once we do that, we'll have to reconnect the upstream and downstream channels of the intermittent stream here. Um, and we will also be replacing two catch basins, one here and one in this parking area down here with deep sump catch basins um, with hooded outlets to provide an improvement in the water quality of these systems getting into the wetlands. Um, we will also be pulling back the outlets, which are currently discharging directly into the wetlands. Um, so pulling those back out here um, and adding some preformed scour holes at the outlets which pro will provide some energy dissipation of the um, stormwater as well as provide um, some help for trapping sediment and debris before it enters the wetlands. Um, we'll also be um, disconnecting two sump pumps which are currently in the roof drainage system and directing those to the catch basins instead. Um, so we will also be doing some restoration plantings as part of this project. We'll be putting um, dogwood uh, three dogwood in each of the swales, as well as some buried plugs pla uh, placed where we're removing sediment in the intermittent stream area. Thanks, Heather. Is that you, you done? Yeah, okay. pretty much covers <laughs> it. <laughs> All right. Um, public comment, if any, please raise your hand. I'll keep an eye on it. I can't see the public right now. Okay, any commissioners? Bruce, I see you. Aaron, uh, with apologies that I didn't find, see it in the folder, can you just really quickly characterize the no email reply to a butters from staff? Yes, thank you. I was just gonna <clears throat> mention that. Um, I did receive one, um, uh, comment, public comment from a Butters. Um, it was from um, a resident of Greenleaves and they were concerned about a stream which flows through the Greenleaves um, uh, condo facility, which is um, south of this location. And they were particularly concerned because there's a stream that flows through the green leaves driveway where there had been a culvert failure and required um, DPW to get involved and um, do an emergency culvert replacement. And they were concerned how this work was gonna impact that area. I did respond back to them and let them know that this is a different stream system. So the stream system that they're referring to that flows into green leaves is actually a different stream system um, that's further south. This stream system um, actually flows north and goes toward, um, uh, I guess, it goes across the street um, uh, toward like sort of the big Y location. Um, so it doesn't flow towards green leaves. So I just wanted to clarify that, but there is a public comment in the folder um, from folks that expressed concern about how this might impact the stream that flows into green leaves. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Anyone else? No, okay. I'm not seeing any public comment. Oh, I got a, Alex, go ahead. It was a nice site visit that took place um, yesterday. And it's, uh, I, it, it, the, drain from the parking lot in the upper part of the screen uh, there'll be a trap there and that may not be obvious i didn't hear it being said but uh, and there's going to be a maintenance plan i think so that that will be maintained it's full of sand right now so um all the material off the parking lots has been deposited in the wetland and the channel has just been filled up with sand off the parking lot and other debris from the parking lot. So that's, uh, as Aaron said, like a restoration, wetland restoration effort. So, um, and the other um, drain that Aaron referred to isn't on the drawing. It's on the, the bottom. If you go to the bottom of the drawing, it's further in another parking lot. Um, 
just south of this this one here. And okay. um, so this, this project will probably will not solve the water in the basements 100%, but it will do a good job of stopping material from entering the wetland and clean it up. Thanks, Alex. So we're looking at an improvement on existing conditions, but maybe there could be more um, with the outside stormwater improvements, as Aaron mentioned. We don't have any jurisdiction over that, so that is a strong recommendation by the commission. Um, given that, is there any more commissioner comments? And if not, I think we're looking to close the public hearing on this. Um, with suggestions of more comprehensive stormwater management. Bruce, I see your hand. Um, is there any reason we couldn't just, um, well, I miss, uh, right, it says issue an order of conditions at the December 13th meeting. Why can't we order uh, issue the order of conditions now? Because the order of conditions isn't drafted yet, um, oh, I didn't have an opportunity reason. to get the <laughs> get the conditions prepared. Sorry. Good question. However, um, so given no more public comment, I'm looking maybe to close the public hearing for this, and that we'll continue it to the December. What is it, thirteenth, um, when we can issue the order of conditions. That was a prompt, anyone? <laughs> Go ahead, Bruce. <laughs> Bruce, you're on mute. I'll go. I yield to Alex. Okay. Move to close the public hearing for notice of intent, DEP number 089-0726 for 370 Northampton Road. Second. Alex on the motion, Bruce on the second. Jason? Second. Or, we are yes. <laughs> Aye. <laughs> Bruce? Aye. Alex? Aye. And I'm I. Okay. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see, next up. The Zengineer, okay. This public hearing is now called to order. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of chapter 131, section 40 of the general laws of the Commonwealth and act relative to the protection of the wetlands as most recently amended and article 3.31 wetlands protection under the town of Amherst bylaw. This is notice of intent for this engineer on behalf of Amherst College for repair of culverts, road maintenance, hazard tree removal, repair of bog and footbridges, and long-term routine maintenance and multiple parcels on Amherst College campus map 14C, lot 73, map 14D, lot 1, map 14C, lot 73, map 17B, lot 1, map 17A, lot 57, map 14D, lot 2, map 14C, lot 89, map 17A, 1, lot 62, map 17A, lot 68, map 17B, lot 3, map 17B, lot 6, map 17B, lot 8. So as you have it, it's a comprehensive <laughs> OMP. And do we have our representative? I see a hand up, Bucky, allowing you to talk. Also, Darren Gray, also. Or, okay, well, we'll have Bucky in and maybe that's public comment, not sure. Anyone else, Aaron, there's some hands up in the public comment, might be, might be comments, but bring them in if they're affiliated. Hi, Bucky, welcome. Bucky, so, do you know if Darren is associated with the project? Darren Gray, yes. Yes, okay. Great, thank you. Uh, Darren Gray, Kenneth Lozier, Lozier okay. and um, Catherine Sims. 
are in all likelihood out there in the ether yes. somewhere. All right. Yeah. Although it's probably just going to be me talking, and I know there's a lot on the agenda. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to dive in and share my screen here in just a minute. Um, once I click the correct button. Yeah. Um, we're going to just let Aaron have five minutes to introduce oh, yes. us to the project. Yep. So go ahead, Aaron, and we'll go to you. Yeah. So um, just I, I know I gave the commission a little bit of background um, in my in my memo on this, but just to give a quick snapshot, um, Amherst College came to us in 2020 with a request for determination. The commission um, urged the Amherst College at that point to file a notice of intent application. They began a very long, very comprehensive process of doing this right. And um, they've been working with me um, for years now to develop this plan. Um, it's included site visits. It's included many, many meetings um, of assembling things. Um, and they've done a great job to assemble this plan. Um, I did provide a list of comments to Bucky I'd like to hand it over to him now so that he can do his presentation and address some of my comments. But I will say that I do think that this project is not only ready for us to close tonight, if the commission so wishes to do so, but also um, I'm prepared to issue the order of conditions. Even with my comments, I've basically um, drafted my comments so that we could roll them into an order of conditions um, with conditions for things to be submitted. Although I know Bucky has already prepared some of the materials that I requested. So um, I'll turn it over to, to Bucky now. Okay. Thanks for your review, Aaron. Go ahead, Bucky. All right. Thank you very much. Right. Let me now share the screen if I can. All right. Um, so I you know, normally for a project of this complexity, you know, I would be talking like a very long time about all the details. But and as you know, it's a very long submittal that we've made and time is short. So I'm going to do this high level review um, and move on. I'm going to introduce the project team uh, from Amherst College. We should have on the call Kenneth Lozier. Supervisor of Landscape and Grounds, Catherine Sims, Professor, both of whom are also co-chairs of the Sanctuary Stewardship Committee. So they are my primary contacts on this project and part of the, the visioning group to maintain and move this sanctuary forward. We also have Darren Gray, who's another civil engineer and more importantly, the Capital Projects Manager for Amherst College. Ward Smith did the wetlands delineation and I am Bucky Sparkle. Uh, briefly, I think most people who live in Amherst area are aware of the Amherst College Wildlife Sanctuary. It was established in 1933, 90 years ago, and since then the college has been in a position of continuous stewardship of the environment. Uh, there are a whole bunch of stakeholders who are involved in this piece, multiple pieces of land, uh, not just the Sanctuary Stewardship Committee, uh, which is the long range steering committee, uh, but there are classes and research projects that are constantly out here. Cross-country teams train and compete out here. Uh, the student body and alumni are out here. There's a, a relatively well-known benefit race. And uh, a host of community members are in and out of these lands. The sanctuary combined is about 500 acres, a whole bunch of different ecosystems, meadows, woods, waterways of all types, and of course, wetlands. Um, the property is a, it's a sanctuary uh, for all sorts of flora and fauna, as well as much human activity, recreational activity, research, et cetera. And the, oh, over this large area, as you might imagine, we're dealing with multiple resource areas. So wetlands, land under water bodies and waterways, bank and riverfront, even just a little bit of riverfront within the limits of work that we're proposing. And there are two natural heritage priority habitats on the property. And then I'm gonna try and condense 16 pages of plans and 184 pages of submittal to this slide effectively and talk about at a high level what's going on here. So there are roughly four types of projects at 15 different sites. And I've kind of color coded them here. This is a map of the sanctuary with Amherst College um, being in the top left corner. At sites A and B, these are culvert replacement projects. There are massive failures at these locations. The road is impassable. It's dangerous to walk over. Uh, these are sort of you know, cut and dry opportunities. We are able to make uh, one excellent 
uh, stream crossing through here and bring it up to stream crossing standards um, of the two. One, one we just can't, and we could get into the details as to why, but we get one stream crossing where we have none. Another type of project was, I say past tense, was uh, tree uh, hazard tree removal in these green areas, the D1, D2 areas. The trees were so hazardous that at the last site visit, uh, Erin suggested that we considered emergency certification. So we've worked with her office and have actually received approval and have taken down the trees. So the D1 and D2 work is no longer part of the application because it is complete. These brown areas are bog bridge and footbridge replacement projects. Now these trails have been here since the 30s and 40s. Um, the bridges have been here as long. The current version of these bridges have been in at least since 1983. We have, we have verification of that. So this is all old infrastructure and it is structurally unsound and we need to repair sections of bog bridge, occasionally replace them, repair um, and re really replace the footbridges. I will say that part of this application is to gain approval for the conceptual replacement of these footbridges and the uh, application indicates, you know, some details about staying out of resource areas, elevating them, using helical piles, minimizing disturbance, but we do not have structural designs for these bridges yet. So the commission is going to see uh, these sites C, E, F, and G at some point in the future where uh, we'll come back with, with detailed plans for exactly how these bridges are going to be replaced as sort of uh, an extension or amendment of this notice of intent when we have that details. The last type of work that we have on site is road reinforcement. So all these pink or magenta areas, sites H and I1 through 7 that go through this lower meadow, uh, all of these areas are pre-existing roads uh, that access vehicles use regularly to get out there and perform maintenance operations. Uh, they are also used uh, you know, hikers, the cross-country racers, and in a few areas there have been historic crossings of uh, wetlands. They are they're getting pretty beat up, very muddy. The Devastation to the ecosystem is expanding further and further into the resource area as people are trying to walk around the muddy spot to get to the drier spot and turn that into the mud hole. So we really would like to condense and um, stabilize this area by installing in the H&I sites uh, a cellular confinement system. This one's called a GeoWeb and it's a, it's a flexible system that allows water to move laterally and vertically we would infill with a permeable stone so that we still have a pervious surface and it would then also be able to support the uh, vehicles that go out there that the campus owns as well as provide a stable surface for hikers runners riders any other anybody else who's using those trails uh, i do want to point out that these projects at these various sites, um, it is extremely unlikely the college is going to be able to have all of the capital funding to do all of this at once. So we are going to phase the construction, prioritizing the athletic field. So uh, the, the road reinforcements, these site I locations are uh, the top priority. And as the funding becomes available, the rest of these uh, bits of work are going to be implemented. And we will keep in touch with Aaron as we go. Um, and I'll talk more about that later. In addition to these very specific rehabilitation of existing infrastructure jobs, there is this ongoing routine maintenance that we would like to, we are rolling into this notice of intent just to get a, you know, sort of the blessing of a discrete list of work, basically um, replacing signposts, clearing by hand culverts or ditches, ongoing mowing of the fields, and um, a, a few other items that, that are delineated in the notice of intent. Again, we can go into these details if, if you have interest. Um, now, I did receive, as she said, from Erin comments yesterday, um, most of which seem you know, very you know, typical and understandable, reasonable, uh, they're all reasonable. Uh, there are a few that uh, I do want to you know, respond to and highlight those responses in tonight's short amount of time. Uh, yes, we will absolutely have an engineer on site available for the infrastructure rehab projects, you know, the beginning, middle and end, not necessarily full construction observation, but 
an engineer, probably me, is going to be out there making sure things start right, are going well, and end well before the certificate of compliance is requested. Also, Aaron asked about uh, more detail in the watering. So I have uh, added a little more information to sheet three. I did submit the updated plans uh, earlier today. And uh, I've included those notes on the screen. And effectively, what we're going to try and do is use uh, sandbags as much as possible. Uh, and in some case, that's probably going to be fine. In another case, we're almost certainly going to have to do some bypass pumping. We want to limit that to the shortest amount of time possible. We're going to use sediment traps as well for that pump discharge and uh, really try and use gravity to move water to the greatest extent possible. Aaron also had some comments about erosion controls, uh, most of which I think was already addressed on sheet four in some of the details, which I have appended, uh, sort of cut out of my own plans and just pasted into this screen here about, you know, the details of the sediment log, the wattle, um, erosion blankets, and how stockpiles are going to be working. In terms of stockpiles, that was uh, of another question that Aaron had, and uh, I uh, amended this map a little bit. And before we get into the details, I'll say that stockpile locations are going to be strongly influenced by which contractor is there, what equipment they have available, what personnel and manpower they're going to have available. So we may have a lot of need to stockpile. We may have a very little need to stockpile. But in all cases, any stockpile locations will be at least 25 feet away from any resource areas, farther if we can get it. Some of these sites you can't get more than 10 feet. Well, you can't, you can get 25 feet away, but, but that's about it. You're kind of surrounded by resource areas out there. Um, and any stockpiles of erodible materials will absolutely have a uh, down gradient barrier, silt fence wattle, depending on the material that will protect uh, downstream resource areas. And of course, during the pre-construction phase, uh, we would be able to talk about stockpile locations uh, with Aaron and come up with any plans if necessary. Um, obviously, there, there's a lot of information in the overall submittal and an awful lot of details. Erin did mention that we had been working on this a while, and it's been a lot of back and forth, and she's given us a huge amount of support and feedback. And I'm pretty sure we've done a good job accommodating uh, the needs of both the Local Bylaw and the Wetlands Protection Act. So at this point, I'm happy to uh, turn it back to the Commission and answer any questions. Thank you, Bucky, for the very thorough and thoughtful NOI. We appreciate it. And we've had a chance to look at it for a while now. So hopefully the commissioners have reviewed it and Aaron's comment, and we can possibly keep the questions minimal. But if there's any public um, that have a question, please raise your hand. I'm going to keep an eye on it. I see Kenny is up. So I'm going to give you a minute, Kenny. Um, you're muted. But go ahead. I, I'm not here to question. I'm I'm with the group. I'm with Amherst College. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm I'm with Amherst. I'm not here to question. I'm got with it. Amherst yep. College. Yep. Yep. Oh, <laughs> Are you, so you're just here. Sorry. Yeah, he doesn't want to comment. He's just, I see. He's just okay. representing, and I Thank think you he can't get his hand down. All right. See ya. Okay, Bruce, go ahead. So I just I, I appreciate the uh, uh, extraordinary amount of work, and gradually uh, on all of that for the people who work on it. Um, the one thing I want to emphasize is that the maps and, the, and a lot of the discussion focuses on the trails, but it's also a wildlife sanctuary. And if you look at the four bridge sites that are, were highlighted, and you go to the selected points of interest on the Amherst website, every one of those has some significant wildlife piece uh, noted. They thought it was significant to actually write it down here. Um, and so I just want to make sure that it's kept top of mind to really focus on preparation for these construction things, given that they're pretty close to the places where some of the even endangered things, endangered birds have been seen and may still be there. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Yeah. Bucky, do you want to respond to that? Or is there a plan in place for timing, possibly? Oh, uh, but there are some timing elements. We're talking specifically about the bridge sites in this case. I know Natural Heritage had timing issues, but that was related to the priority habitat to the south. 
uh, where the bridges are, that was the habitat to the north. Up there, the only species of concern per natural heritage um, was the climbing fern. And we do have to uh, re-up, we have, we have done biological surveys with Pete Westover, Conservation Works. They do expire. And by the time we would get out there in the spring, if we are there that early, uh, we would have to redo those surveys. So that that is one thing we are aware of the climbing fern out there. Uh, I am I'm not so familiar with Amherst College website and content to to know specifically what what Mr. Stebman is uh, referring to in terms of of bird species relative to these uh, bridges. I will say that it, the type of construction we're we're talking about is not like road bridge construction. There will be very little disturbance of earth and vegetation, um, very little disruption to the ecosystem. Probably some bank stabilization because there's some serious erosion going on uh, in the vicinity of these bridges. So very okay. very little habitat is going to be impacted on any level during construction of the the bridges and bog bridges. Well, I will read them to you. Just look at their website. They, in, attached to the map is this thing called selected points of interest with numbers on all those all those numbers that are on their map refer to something that they thought was important. And just the one example is 508, the northern edge, a pair of rare sedge wrens nested there several years ago. Well, maybe they're not there now, but they might I, absolutely. I, I have no doubt um, that, I mean, the, the Sanctuary Committee you know, has been for almost 100 years working really hard to maintain the biodiversity out there. That is a, a fundamental purpose for okay. this, the land. And we're not talking about people who are trying to you know build a subdivision or... A no, no, I wasn't, I wasn't asserting that. Sure, no, no, of course. Urging of course. awareness. Um, I, I am... I have no doubt that the sanctuary committee is going to remain very closely involved in the construction processes as they unfold. Fair enough. Thank you. Darren, go ahead. Thank you. And thanks for the question, Mr. Stedman. Um, I'm a capital project manager with Amherst College and working closely with Bucky and Kenny and Kate in the preparation and um, you know, gone through the plans in great detail with Bucky. And I, I can just speak on, you know, the college's behalf from the project side, like we would certainly keep very close reins on the contractors, you know, via you know, pre-construction meetings, regular construction meetings and site visits. I mean, I love any excuse to walk the trails during my work day, to be honest. Um, and also, of course, uh, work with Ms. Jock as well um, to make sure things are done well and correctly. And um, I certainly learned in my time here at Amherst um, how much the campus and the sanctuary community values these lands. And the, and the biodiversity out there and hearing about the different research projects. So we're certainly aligned with you on the importance of uh, protecting everything out there and around these sites. Thanks, Darren. Dave, go ahead. Yeah, thanks very much, Michelle. I'll be brief. Um, no, I just want to appreciate um, and acknowledge all the time and effort that the college and and Bucky and Aaron have put into this. I think, I think it's wonderful and I uh, look forward to, you know, the phasing in of all these projects. I had a couple of questions and I apologize. I have not had a chance to look at these, uh, the, the plans in detail, but um, I guess one just note is that, you know, the town has been working for a number of years on the health and well being of the Fairing Brook. And I just wanted to kind of note it in this process that, you know, the Fairing Brook does go through the northeast section of the sanctuary. Um, Aaron and I through the years have talked about and talked to the college about the incredible opportunity we have to um, mitigate some of the impacts of, of water quality in that brook and, and before it reaches the Fort River. So just something for the college to think about in the future. I don't think this plan obviously is you know, geared toward that and focused on that, but I just wanted to um, get that you know, in the record that hopefully we can work on that in future years. I also wondered, and maybe again, I apologize if I have not reviewed these in great detail, but um, is there a plan for, you know, uh, trailhead signage at the public facing uh, points of the sanctuary, i.e. South Pleasant Street, Southeast Street, College Street? 
um, particularly, you know, I've, I've mentioned this before, you know, particularly the South Pleasant Street entrance to the sanctuary. Um, I, I've used the term underwhelming. Um, I think that's a very generous term, but is there a, does the plan include that? And again, apologies if it does. Uh, David, the, the plan specifically doesn't address uh, signage at the locations that you indicate. And I, I can't speak to whether or not the uh, Sanctuary Committee is, is looking at providing that. Maybe Ken Lozier has something to offer in that regard, but it, it hasn't really come up in any of the planning discussions. As part of the NOI, we do talk about replacing signs, but not the installation of new signs necessarily. So okay. um, I don't necessarily need it. You know, it's I don't need it necessarily tonight. I'm just saying it would be nice if the college considered that because the sanctuary is pretty subtle. And although it's used by the public, I think it's points of entry from the community standpoint you know, are mostly along the rail trail and within the college itself, but there are points of entry that are along those roadways that I mentioned that really there's close to no signage and particularly the South Pleasant Street side, which is just really an old rickety fence that's falling down. So it, it doesn't, it, the outward facing piece of it is is pretty underwhelming, as I said. Um, so Fearing Brook, uh, signs, kiosks, um, and those were my main comments or questions for the future. So look forward to working with you as the college phases this in. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Great public access comment. Um, I want to circle back to Bruce and the Sedrens, which are a state endangered species. Um, so we talked about working with the engineers. Um, I guess I'm confused as to why Natural Heritage hasn't weighed in on this uh, if there are no nesting habitat and what the plan is, because this isn't about just the construction workers checking out if there's some birds around. This is actual like the need for a uh, a survey. So um, I don't know if this is the time to look into it, but if there is documented nesting sedrens, like I think we need to pay attention to that and have a better plan for any kind of construction that's going on in that area, especially with the timing. Um, this could be just a, a matter of timing, like planning it for the fall and not the breeding season, but I would not want to see any kind of impacts happening in April or May or June, um, with Cedrens. So, um, Aaron, I'm not sure if this is the time to, to figure this into the NOI or the conditions, but, um, I didn't know about this before. So thank you, Bruce, for bringing it up. But if that is in fact a species of interest in the this location, I think that's something we need to pay attention to and possibly remind natural heritage of it. So part of the issue might be that it's, um, even if it's there's a documented um, threatened or endangered species, it doesn't always mean that it's mapped on the natural heritage atlas. Um, I can certainly um, look into that more, but, um, from what I understand, the NHESP has has provided a determination letter on this. And Bucky, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I don't think that the area. Oh, looking at this right now, um, trying to get a sense of whether the area in question is in fact. Um, okay, so that might be almost a documentation or bureaucratic criteria that is not going to be part of this. Um, but if there is documentation of sedrens, I mean, all we can ask you to do is possibly do a bird survey beforehand. And I'm sure that um, many of the people on this wildlife sanctuary would be happy to do that for sedren. I, I anticipate that there would be a, a number of volunteers uh, in that capacity. If not, we can always uh, get Pete West, Pete West over somebody with uh, biological background, not me. You don't want me to do this, but uh, uh, to, to look around. I am pretty confident in understanding that there will be virtually no soil or vegetation disturbance for the installation of these bridges, uh, which was in the vicinity uh, 
the ferry and broken item 508 uh, was that selected point of interest, but we'll definitely keep an eye out for them. There's bird people on campus that I know I don't have access to, but they can take a look around. Okay. okay do you think that the, that, um, the college might be amenable to a condition where um, the work is restricted to not be done for April, May, and June in the areas where the nesting sites are known to be? Uh, for If it's just those three months, I would be very surprised if they would say no. There are members of the college here who could speak directly on that issue. Yeah, I mean, if there are certain locations that are of concern, um, I don't see a problem with avoiding those months. I mean, it still gives us, you know, July and August when the, when things are quieter. Well, at least on the campus, maybe we have more um, local folks, but I, I don't see that being an issue. You know, especially if it's like, if it's like a, something we discover a, a, a concern or something of value out there and you're very careful about, like, I think we'd, we'd want to be careful in those months and, and avoid it. I think we'd agree with you there, you know? Sure. I mean, it might have been a very interesting year for Cedren and a one-off, but um, anyway, I'm going on information provided tonight. So, Bruce, I saw your hand up. Um, just that on again on the points of interest, it talks about nine ten. There isn't one on the map, but nine nine oh nine is right by one of the bridges, and it says American kestrels steep decline over the last twenty years. So, same same concept. Yeah, so maybe time of year on these sort of sensitive um, adjacent nesting habitats would be um, an, a consideration for this. Dave, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, just on the Sedren, I was unaware that there is a document or there was a documented nesting there. Was there a year on that? Is it, where did that come Bruce, from? You're, you're uh, muted. Yeah, yeah. It's on the points, selected points of interest attached to the sanctuary trails from the Amherst College website. Okay. So, um, all, yeah, I mean, Sedrens, yeah, there are sporadic nesters in the valley, quite rare nesters in the valley. And as Michelle said, state listed, they do occur, you know, off and on in Hadley and Amherst. Um, we've had nestings on Amherst conservation land before. They're kind of a wet meadow, dry to wet meadow breeder. Um, so I'm not as familiar, obviously, as other folks with, with this map or with this submittal. But I would also suggest maybe that that Aaron and the Amherst College folks could, I was thinking a little later too, Michelle, like into, into July and August, because I know they're still, they can still be on territory at that point. So maybe Aaron could work with Bucky and the team on what that, uh, sensitive window looks like because um, I, I I know this year we actually had Sedren's nest in Amherst this year on Amherst conservation land and they were active well into July and August so right thanks Dave good point um, so I think there's a certain number of points which are identifiable with these numbers that might be um, adjacent or in proximity to sensitive nesting bird habitats that might benefit from having a time of year restriction on the activity. So I think that's something that Aaron and you guys could talk about offline. Kate, I see your hand up, go ahead. Hi, thanks very much. Uh, Kate Sims, I work at the College in Environmental Studies and Economics and have been part of the Sanctuary Stewardship Committee uh, since the beginning of this process. And I just wanted to say a big thank you to the commissioners um, and to Aaron and to Dave for weighing in on everything tonight. And I wanted to respond quickly just to one of Dave's comments about the access and public access, uh, just to say that I was noting those comments for the Sanctuary Stewardship Committee and would be bringing those back to the committee. Um, one of the reasons why the public access on South Pleasant Street has been limited at this point is because that's one of the areas that needs to be repaired and restored uh, before we want people walking through there. Uh, but very much share your hope that that will uh, in the longer run be accessible again and something that we can uh, promote with, with better signage. Um, and with respect to the biological dimensions, I just wanted to add that those points of interest are um, were created in most cases about 10 years ago, and we haven't had the chance to update um, everything with those maps. So it is very much worth our trying to review that information um, 
And uh, you'll note that in Bucky's plan, a lot of the details, especially of the any bridge construction, uh, would be coming back to the commission before anything were to move forward uh, with the bridges specifically. So uh, there would be a chance for, uh, I believe, further uh, discussion at, at, at that point of any of those areas. So I just wanted to add those points. Uh, thanks very much. And a big thanks to Erin for all of her time on this. Great. Thanks, Kate. Okay, um, I, we got to move on, but I think uh, the last question I have here is, is this land preserved? And we're talking about um, you know, permitting butlin impacts and what we're interested in, is this, this land preserved for recreation or wildlife in any kind of perpetual way? Um, and if not, would you consider doing so? Um, here's a point where I might rely a little more heavily upon uh, the Amherst College staff here if they have. I know they've been looking into that a little bit. I see Darren's hand just popped up there, so I'm going to let him speak on that topic. Well, I've, I've asked around since we received um, the memo, and I haven't heard anything definitive yet. Um, so I, I can't say, I guess, if there's any you know, deed restrictions or conservation restrictions officially on the record. Um, I mean, certainly, you know, Amherst, you know, guiding principles are, are that this land stay protected and, and uh, you know, given the extent of resource areas out there, I, I don't know that development could even happen. Um, so I guess I don't have a very clear answer. Uh, I, I can inquire further on it, but at this point, I haven't been able to, to uncover anything. It's, it's been like a day and a half, I think, since the question, uh, that, since I saw the question, so. Okay, thank you, Darren. Not I think great. we would have, what's that? But not a great answer, a very thorough yeah. answer. Yeah, um, no, I, yeah, I understand you've had very little time. Well, we would appreciate um, a follow-up on that, like what the uh, long-term planning is for Amherst College, just given the investment that we are discussing here tonight um, and some long-term protections for the recreation and wildlife on the site, as we discussed thoroughly and is provided in the plan. Um, so given that, if anybody has any further comments, unless they do, I'm looking for a motion now to close the public hearing and issue an order of conditions. If I could just, before the motion is made, um, I did draft um, sort of insert the conditions in and um, with the commission's blessing and and uh, the applicant's representative's blessing, I would just modify those based on the materials that have been submitted by the applicant um, prior to tonight's meeting. So where I said, for example, a dewatering plan has to be submitted, I would note the dewatering plan was already submitted, et cetera, for the for the other items where they've they've been provided. Um, and then the other thing is, um, I would just add the condition that we discussed to. Um, determine uh, where appropriate um, time of year restrictions would be necessary and what those restrictions would be. Um, and, and we would leave that sort of an open-ended uh, condition on a site-by-site -site basis uh, to, to determine based on wildlife that are present in the vicinity of the specific, the site-specific work that's proposed, if that makes sense. Go ahead, Dave. Sorry, I know you're trying to close this hearing, but just on that last point about permanent protection, so often I think we focus, when we talk about climate change, we talk about climate resiliency, um, we, 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 we talk about energy, we talk about energy consumption, we talk about carbon, um, but oftentimes what is lost is, you know, how are we going to provide kind of permanently protected open space? And I think just for Kate and, and the Amherst College team thinking about, I know the college has made great commitment to climate change and climate mitigation, but protecting some of the land that the college owns in perpetuity would send a really strong message. You know, the, the town has protected over 4,000 acres of land just in Amherst. Um, you know, uh, I know the college protected some of their land up on the Mount Holyoke Range, but protecting something near the core of the campus, and I realize much of this land may never be developed. We can kind of say maybe never, we don't know what's gonna happen in 40, 60, 100 years, but 
you know, just if you could, you know, with the powers that be in Amherst College, talk about maybe the sanctuary proper, putting a conservation restriction on it with the town, with the state, or with some entity like Kestrel Trust might make sense in the long term and and build on your commitment to uh, to uh, climate change planning and climate resiliency. So that's all. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. Absolutely. Go ahead, Alex. You're on mute. Or we can't hear you. So we can't hear Alex. Sorry, Alex. <laughs> Um, I, you can always send a chat through the message, but I think we're going to have to close this up. So raise your hand if it's critical. Okay. All right. Um, well, I don't know how he's going to vote, but I'm looking for a motion, a couple of them. So I think he's leaving and coming back. All right. President members. I will uh, move to close the public hearing for notice of intent DEP number 089-0725 for Amherst College comprehensive multiple sites and motion to uh, move to issue an order of conditions DEP number 089-0725 with the noted special conditions and boilerplate conditions under the Wetlands Protection Act and Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws also note, since no AMRAD was filed, the commission is not approving the resource area delineation as part of this review. Thanks, Jason. Can we move on two motions at the same time, Erin? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Second on both. All right, Jason on two. <laughs> Bruce on two. Um, Jason. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Alex. I'm an eye. I think we still have lost. Yeah, he gave on. he gave a thumbs he up. Did. He okay. went All thumbs right. up. We have, an, we have an eye on Alex. All right, so moved. All right, thank you, Bucky. Thank you, Darren. Thank you, Kate, for being here tonight. I appreciate everyone thank you. sure to relay um, you know, the thoughts and concerns uh, that are kind of broader than just what's going to be in the order of conditions. I appreciate everyone's feedback and participation. Thank you. Yeah. Good luck yeah. with the rest of your agenda tonight. Thank you. And speaking of that, I know we went over commissioners, but um, that was a big one. So I think it is worth our time. Okay, next up, we have um, another one to open. This public hearing is now called to order. The hearing is being held as required by the provisions of chapter 131, section 40 of the general laws of the Commonwealth and Act relative to the protection of the wetlands is most recently amended in article 3.31, wetlands protection in the town of Amherst general bylaws. This is for a notice of intent for wetland when Wendell Wetland Services on behalf of Eric Olson for a proposed restoration of a 2300 square foot man-made pond by dredging and replanting at 296 Pomeroy Lane, map 28D, lot six. We have anyone here tonight, please raise your hand. Um, so I'd be happy to give the commission a quick update on this. Um, I, I did want to state, though, that I'm a little concerned that we can't hear Alex, um, and I don't know, Alex, if you would might be willing to to exit the meeting and just try to re-enter. That way we can have you involved with the meeting, because I'm just really worried. We, we've got only got four members um, that it's going to be important that we hear your voice. Okay, Alex, try rejoining. Um, Bruce, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Well, I was going to ask, Alex, can you hear me? So if you go to the microphone on the lower left, and you click on the little up arrow and go to audio settings at the very bottom of the list. And you click on that, it shows you the microphone and, and maybe your microphone is down at zero or something. We can't hear you still. It's odd that he was fine before and isn't right. now. Yeah. Um, well, I think uh, we've got a lot more business to cover, and yeah. so I just want to make sure that we we that Alex is with us. Um, okay. How about you try logging back on, and if that doesn't work, you can call in, perhaps. Okay. He's got yeah. Up. Good idea. Good idea. 
Um, so we'll right, go just, ahead, Aaron. just yep. give him two minutes to do that and I'll just give the commission a quick update. So um, in my memo, um, commissioners have probably seen that I had um, extensive comments on this. Um, obviously, it's not a state protected resource, but um, it is a resource area, and I think it's um, it's really important that we protect it. And um, so there was a number of issues that I um, I had with it. The time of year for this project being kind of at the top of my list. Alex, can can you speak? No, not working. Um, so he's going to call in. Um, um, so anyways, the bottom line is I, I did have extensive comments on this. Um, I think that they uh, had some additional details that they need to um, resolve in terms of the time of year, the dewatering process, how the dewatering is going to be controlled, um, how the turbidity is turbidity from the um, dredged pond is going to be dealt with. And I did speak to their consultant yesterday and um, I they kind of said that they were considering um, coming up with a new plan in terms of how they address how they go about doing it, um, potentially doing putting in a turbidity curtain and doing half the pond at a time, which I feel like is a much more um, feasible option. Uh, and that way there's some sanctuary for the wildlife that they're um, going to be disrupting when they're dredging. Um, so uh, they've requested a continuance from the commission, but I wanted to let the commission know that they're um, they're aware of the um, challenges here and they're trying to come up with a, a plan to address the challenges. Um, I want to I'm trying to keep talking so we can buy some time for Alex because we don't have a quorum right now. Um, there is there any communication with him? Your hands up, Bruce. Go ahead. Well, I went on the site visit, and I can I can second Aaron's concern about both the wildlife part and especially the the dewatering part. Um, it's going to be really challenging. Um, that anything that he can do to work with the DPW, because that there's a a lot of stuff there that is sort of town infrastructure, some of which doesn't look like it's functioning very well, and so there it, it, it's a more complicated thing than it appears um, when you start to look at it. And in in Aaron's notes, there's these questions about where's this and where's that. Well, as far as I could tell, he the owner has tried. Uh, according to him, he has tried, and he can't find it. These, some of these pipes were built many decades ago, and he can't find any of it. So it's a problem, and they're not, they're probably ceramic like that, so they're not metal. He can't go around with a metal detector and find it. Hmm. Okay. Alex, do you want to do a quick check? Still can't hear you. Yeah, I'm concerned that that's going to present a problem for us. Yeah. So, do you want to try calling in and um, maybe texting us if you have questions? I don't really know how else to handle that because we can't see your hand up if you're calling. Um. <clears throat> Alex, do you need the call-in number? Or perhaps just stay on video and call in on your phone since our wiener feedback. That's actually not a bad idea. Um, you could just mute your computer. Obviously, you're already muted anyway, but you could call in to have voice contact. Um, let me let me pull up the call-in number and just put it on the screen for a minute. That way um, you can um, get on because we... We'll be in trouble if we can't get through this agenda. Yeah, I mean, just looking at that, I'm suspecting there is some wildlife activity like wood frogs and beavers and I don't know, it looks like a functioning pond. So I'm glad you mentioned the time of year aspect. Um, otherwise, it sounds like Bruce has highlighted some known complexities of the 
inflow outflow. Um, so once Alex is able to communicate, I think we're looking for a continuance. I move to continue the public hearing for Shootsbury Road and Rat to 745 p.m. on 12-13-23. I well, I think we're looking for the Pomeroy. Is it? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, the wrong one. Yeah. I move on. to continue the public hearing to 740 on 12 13 23. I will second that. All right. We have Bruce on the motion, Jason on the second. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Alex, thumbs up counts. Yes. He's an I. Okay, I'm an I. Can we do that, Aaron? Can we do um, visual? I, I'd really like to get his his voice on the on the vote okay. um because we're on a virtual call. I think that's gonna be important. Um <clears throat> Alex, are you um are you in the meeting on your phone? Um, can you look at the Zoom invite and possibly call in on your phone so we have you and and then just connect that way and then we'll see you both on your computer video and then have you on audio. The significance here being that we need Alex for quorum. One other potential thing we may be able to do is have Alex share his screen and try to walk through fixing his microphone if that was potentially an issue. Somehow it okay. got switched. I wonder if he clicked mute on his computer instead of on the Zoom too. I know um, on my headset, sometimes I can click mute and then I can't be heard. Um, <clears throat> So the computer right. might have Let's try the quick solution and then we'll um the only other thing I can think of is if I called Alex on my cell phone. Yeah, um, just call just call Alex and put him on speaker. Like <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean uh it's just uh it's gonna give me feedback, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, so Alex, are you able to call the number on your phone? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Can't hear you. He's saying what's Which the number? number? What number? Three, um, I think you I think you can just pick one, like the 301 715 8592. He did that. Okay. I okay. think I should just call him at this point. <laughs> um I'm not really sure how else we're gonna get through this. He's gonna try it one more time. Alex, can you hear me? Okay. So um you you motioned I on two votes. <laughs> can you just confirm that? Yeah, I was trying to dial the freaking old one. Oh. Okay. Okay. All right, well, we found a technological workaround to the technological advances. <laughs> okay, are we good then? We have him at least for audio on your phone for the votes. Yes? Now I can't hear you. You're on mute. The only, it's 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 giving me feedback in my ear because when you can talk- you just, can, can you just mute him until we need him to vote? Yes, that's okay. what I'm going to have to do. All right, um, that's fine. But if Alex, if you have a specific question, no one else can talk, um, and I have to remute you before anyone can talk in order for this to work. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Pa maybe put your hand down, Alex, and just raise it if you need to talk again, and then we'll do the rigmarole. All right. All right. Okay. So where are we now? Um. Uh. Let's see. 
We're at pure sky. Okay, may I move on? Yeah, this is going to be challenging, but I'm going to do my best. Just just mute him until we... I, yeah, I can't mute him entirely. I'll try. Okay. Do you, would you rather I call him, Aaron? Because if so, just send me his con contact. No, I had to take him off speaker, so he's just going to have to raise his hand when he wants okay. to talk, and he's going to be here. Okay, me. we'll get there one way or another. <laughs> okay, okay, this is open, correct? Yes, it is. All right. So do we have somebody here from Pure Sky? Um, no, they've they've submitted a request for continuation. Uh, where this is at is that um, the, the check was received from Pure Sky. It was deposited with the town. I've been waiting on an account number. I just received the account number today and have been in touch with our procurement officer, but there we have to set up a contract. So um, until we have a contract set up, we can't proceed with the peer review which we're working on. Um, so we just need a continuation until we can make some progress. Okay, I'm looking for a continuation. Move to continue the public hearing for Shootsbury Road and Red to 7.45 p.m. on 12-13-23. I'll second that. All right, you, Bruce on the motion, Jason on the second. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. I'm an I. Alex? Got it. Good, sure. good job, guys. <laughs> all right. Moving on. <laughs> um, all right. We have a notice of intent for AMHAD. Do we have anyone here for that? Um, yes. I'm sorry. Should we take public comment for the Pure Sky? Um, I think it's okay just to do the continuation okay. considering the situation we're in at the all moment. Right. <laughs> all right. AMHAD. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to add, uh, Zachary Gless to the panel. Um, I know also that Glenn Kravosky was calling in. I just need to check Glenn, um, his number so that I can pull him in. I, I know last time we had some trouble adding him, but we're going to try again. 508 is Glenn. I'm going to add him in as a panelist or just allow him to talk, um, but while um, while Glenn and Zachary are joining, just for the sake of keeping this um, going, I'm going to give the commission a little update. Um, previous uh, hearing, I provided a list of comments to um, the engineer and the wetland consultant. Um, they responded with a variety of revisions. I went through those revisions. Um, this was very last minute um, in terms of um, uh, getting through the revisions and making sure they were all taken care of. Um, as of like yesterday, this morning, um, there was a couple outstanding questions um, which are on your screen right now. I'm not going to bother reading through them, um, but what I can say is that um, to the best of my knowledge, all have been satisfied with the exception. The only one that I can't confirm has been satisfied is that there was a plan note on the plan noting detention basin that had to be revised to infiltration basin. I know Zachary sent me an updated plan. I have not yet verified that the change has been made, but he's confirming that the plan has been changed and he sent me a revision. Um, based on all of this at this point, I'm comfortable um, closing the public hearing and um, we would not be issuing the order of conditions tonight because it's not prepared, but just to um, close the public hearing and then I can prep the order of conditions prior to the next meeting. Thanks, Erin. Um, so we're gonna close the public hearing. Did you want to do that with the condition that the applicant will grant us an extension um, if we need it, the 21 day extension. We, um, go ahead. This Sorry. is Glenn Kowalski. We would, we would grant the extension, uh, our pleasure. Uh, Mr. Glass should be on also. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Aaron, is that correct? Just so we know what to do with the motion, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's fine. I, I think it's kind of a um, uh, 
it just administrative at this point because they already sent us the revision, but okay. I haven't confirmed that the revision was received. So appreciate the fact that they've granted us the 21 day extension if we need it. But I believe we have everything we need um, to issue the order at the on the 13th of December. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, do Zach, do you have anything else to add or? No, I think that covers it. Um, again, I did make that last final plan revision change that I did send over to Aaron. Um, I made sure that all, you know, um, inferences of that detention basin have been revised to infiltration basin. So that should satisfy everything there. Great. Thank you. Public, if you have any comments, just raise your hand. I'm going to keep an eye on you. Do it quickly, though, because we're trying to move on. So, um, all right. Commissioners, any comments? Questions? Alex, I'm just going to rely on you to put your camera on and raise your hand if you have anything. Otherwise, I'm looking for a motion to continue oh, to, um, to close to close it. Thank you. All right, I see no hands up. So, Commissioner is looking for a motion to close I, the public I hearing. Move the, I move to close the public hearing for 28 green leaves. Um. Uh, DEP number 0890723. Bruce on the motion. Alex on the second. Jason. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Alex. And you're an eye, Michelle. I'm an eye. I, I couldn't hear Alex, just for the record. You want to say it again, Alex? Bye. There we go. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Thank you. No, that's important. I'm glad you... <laughs> Thank, All right. you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks for hanging in there with Thank us. you very much for your time. So, so much time. Thank you very much. Thank, have a good day. Bye. <clears throat> okay. Um... <laughs> The town of Amherst. Um, it's Dave presenting this one, or Aaron, do you want to take this way? Um, I don't know if Dave is going to be jumping on for this or not, but this is what I can tell you. Um, oh, there he is. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Dave, oh, go ahead, go ahead, that? Aaron. You, you, we we have the uh, letter from Natural Heritage, but go ahead. Yes. So um, since the last meeting, we um, met with Natural Heritage, submitted a plan revision to them to address their concerns. Um, they submitted a, a determination letter today. So um, we're hopeful that uh, the commission will um, close the public hearing tonight so that we can move to issue an order of conditions at the next meeting. Okay. Public comment. Please raise your hand if you have any Commissioners, any questions or comments? All right, hearing none. Um, I talked to Aaron about this offline and the town has done everything they can to address the natural heritage comments and moved around trails and um, done some core protections for habitat, turtle habitat. So it looks good to me. Does anyone have any comments or questions? So this is phase one of a multi-phase project and is necessary to close this and move on for um, the grants. Okay, hearing none, looking for a motion to close the public hearing for DEP number 089-0721. Um, I'll second. Bruce on the motion, Jason on the second. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. I'm an aye. Alex? Did you get it? I can infer. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> oh. All right. Um, <laughs> page two of the agenda. 
SWCA on behalf of the University of Massachusetts for construction of a gravel parking lot and associated stormwater structures on the 100, 100 foot buffer zone to boarding vegetated wetland at lot 13, Olympia Drive, map 8D, lot 15, 16, and 3. I do not see Kristen. Is there anybody here for that tonight? Okay, so I think no. we're just continuing this and we're waiting for some um, comprehensive responses to Aaron's questions so we can move on with determination about this. So given that, looking for a motion to continue. So moved. Second. Bruce on the motion, Jason on the second. So Bruce. before there's a vote, um, we just have to make sure that it's noted that the continuation will be to um, December 13th at 7.50 p.m. Great. Thank you. 7.50? Yes. That is 8 o'clock on our... Yeah, I had to move things around because there was some last minute updates since the... Um, okay. Uh, was Since the PowerPoint was sent. I, I, I moved that change. <laughs> okay. Um, Bruce. Aye. Jason. Aye. I'm an I. Alex. <laughs> this is working. Hey. It's amazing. Is it? <laughs> okay. All right. Last one. Uh any public comment, just please raise your hand. I'll keep an eye on it. Um Notice of intent for Tetra Tech on behalf of Fort River Solar 2 LLC for construction of an operation of a 6.35 megawatt direct current ground mounted photovoltaic solar facility and upper, I just have to learn how to say this word, um, upper tenant components at 191 West Pomeroy Lane, map 19D, lot 10. How do you say that word, Aaron? I have no idea. That was just in the application. <laughs> it's a, I assume okay. it's technical. Hopefully it's not a typo. <laughs> no, I've seen it before. I just never said it out loud. Okay. Um, um, do we have anyone here yes. for that? Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll pull in Sean and I believe Matthew are both. Um, and Lawrence is also here. Um, so while they're coming in, uh, if it's okay, I'll just give a quick update. Um, Similar to the other projects in my memo, well, um, yeah, in my memo, I did provide uh, comments um, on one of the last iterations of the plan. Um, the applicant was able to respond with some really comprehensive responses and um, addressed a lot of my questions, which I really appreciate. Um, I have only had about two days to review their comments, so I do have some follow-up questions um, on the project, which um, I can put up on the screen just so folks can see them, but I don't really want to get into them in depth. I've I've talked to the applicant about them. I'm partway through my review of their responses, so I haven't gotten through all of their responses. And there was a couple things that could potentially trigger um, additional revisions, like for example, the DPW wanting um, access road over the sewer line, which wasn't shown on the plans, and then confirmation of the auto turn for the fire department. Um, and so there might be some, and there's some other things like I haven't seen the fate, I haven't had a chance to review the phasing or the containment yet. Um, so I spoke with the applicant earlier um, and ex and explained that, you know, I just need a little more time to get through the their um responses to my comments and um, it, sort of in hopes that we could continue to the 13th to allow more time for me to finish my review and for us to go back and forth on additional changes that might be necessary. But um, the applicant did want to take the opportunity tonight to take any additional public comment and also um, take any additional board questions. So I'll just leave it there. Yeah, I, th I think Aaron kind of summed it up well. Like we we responded to some initial comments, and and we discussed earlier today some comments that you know appear minor in nature, and we can we can surely address those prior to the the next hearing. But we just wanted to go on record tonight to to see if we can gather any additional comments from either fellow commissioners or any members of the public that may be present, just so we can you know present a comprehensive uh, response to to any any concerns that are that still might be out there. You're muted, Michelle. 
Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, I see Bruce with your hand up. Um, if there's any public comment, just keep put your hand up and I'll get to it. Um, go ahead, Bruce. So I went on the site visit and I appreciate um, the, I think all three of you were there and I appreciate the time you took to show, show me the situation. Um, I simply want to re-emphasize my observation that this is a pretty large project inside an even bigger project. And so, I, and I appreciate what I understand to have been very good cooperative discussions and interactions back and forth about that reality with you and the town, uh, and Dave and, and Aaron in particular. And I just ask that it continue all the way through the process because this the, all the trail systems and then all of your work inside that trail system effort it feels complicated to me, and I, I think it's going to need a lot of good communication. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Um, any other commissioners? Have a... Okay. Bruce, just following up on that, do you envision that just the back and forth and sort of notification between the two projects is sufficient, or... It, I mean, I understand there's a comprehensive plan and I don't know, I guess I'm hearing your concern and I'm wondering what's in place to deal with it and what maybe is needed to facilitate that in terms of a plan for meetings other than just what's on the books on this big like 400 I'd, page document. I'd have to yield to Dave and Eric to yeah. tell us what their thinking is about the, the back and forth that's gonna be needed. I will say that on, during the site visit, there was a lot of discussion about the turtles and um, what I felt like was a genuine concern on behalf of, of this team to, to be very mindful and careful about turtle habitat and turtle migration and, and the times when they shouldn't be doing work because the turtles are there and those kinds of things. But to answer your question, uh, Michelle, I think it, Dave's gonna have to answer it. Okay, Dave, see your hand up, go ahead. Yeah, so no, I really appreciate the, the question, Bruce, and, and happy to have the Tetra Tech folks um, or, or Lawrence jump in uh, at any time. Um, yeah, it, it is a very complex project. It's a, it's a complex project with, within the 150 acre complex property. So um, we get that. In fact, uh, Sean, Lawrence, Aaron, and I just met, I want to say it was about a week ago, uh, to kind of talk about the, the uh, coordination between the trail project and, and the solar project. And the way the solar project's timeline has worked out, um, uh, it, it just so happens might be in some ways advantageous for our trail project um, because we're we're on a really tight timeline. I know I know I know Pure Sky is too, but we need to spend this grant money and get the these trails uh, built by the end of June of 24. And so we are going to be you know working really hard to do that. And you know part of that, of course, as Bruce mentioned, is is uh, protection not only of the wetlands and the resource areas, but also the turtle habitat. So we've already had those conversations and those we are gonna have to be having very regular conversations, both you know, by Zoom, but also on the site. So I don't have more structure in that at this point, but our relationship with Pure Sky and, and Tetra Tech so far has been very good, open, transparent. And um, I also wanted to add, if I could, um, that the town is under an obligation to put a conservation restriction on a portion of the property. Uh, obviously the 17 acres that is part of the mitigation for the Pure Sky project will be required to be put under a conservation restriction. And we're working with Misty Ann uh, Merrill at uh, Natural Heritage to move that forward in January and February. So there will be permanent protection once the, the, uh, the solar project and the trail project um, are completed, there will then be uh, a CR put on a portion of the property. That plan will have to come through the Conservation Commission and ultimately the Town Council will have to approve that. So I know that's separate from this notice of intent, but I'll stop there if any, you know, if Sean or 
or uh, Aaron or Lawrence wants to jump in or Matthew, you know, please do. So I'm going to jump in just for a second to note that um, Alex fell off the call, it looks like. I'm not sure exactly what's going on. Um, he is on my phone right now. Um, so I can't. I I can okay, so he, he can hear me. Um, sorry, I, heard, Alex. I heard him. Yeah, he's just not on the call. So this is uh, getting more complex by the second since he's not on. Um, if everyone could just hold for one second. Alex, um, did you did you get a kicked off or are you not able to join back? Okay. I mean, if you have him on the phone, can we consider him present? Does he have to be logged in? Okay, he's he's trying to, his okay. his computer, he had to restart it because okay. his computer froze. Okay. Um, I, I think at this point, my recommendation to the commission is to, um, <clears throat> I, I feel like because we don't have a quorum and we're still taking testimony, we should stop and just... I see a public comment, Erin. Okay. Can I take that while Alex is logging in? Are you suggesting that we um, stop? He's going to be in in two minutes, he said. Okay. Can I ask a question then? Does Pure Sky or Tetratech um, have a separate permit or, I don't know, a letter from NHESP? So are there two separate ones for the same parcel and two different projects that you're operating yeah, we're under? Yeah, we're currently under an active permit um, okay. through September of uh, next year, and we've requested an extension um, okay. of that permit based on the the most recent plan set, which is, you know, this uh, for all intents and purposes is fairly, you know, similar to the set they approved. So we don't anticipate any additional feedback, but we gave them that opportunity to, you know, take a look at that as part of their decision making on an extension of that permit to, to give us enough time uh, next fall, you know, to, to complete the work. Okay. So presumably they're looking at these two in tandem as in the trails project or the Amherst project and your project. And to Bruce's point, there is some like cohesive turtle planning happening at the state level, which is well, also the whole property is, is, um, is governed, if you will, by the, the comprehensive management plan, the CMP from the conservation management plan that the state has authorized. So we, the town Tetra Tech, Pure Sky, we are all, we all have to adhere to that plan. So there has to be that coordination. I was going to add that the other thing that we talked about is um, we will, um, and I haven't reviewed the letter from Natural Heritage, but um, uh, yet, but um, we will likely have, you know, our own turtle um, monitor out there for the trail project as well. It may be Aaron part of the time, it may be some of my staff, or it may be I'll somebody on fire. <laughs> um, so to build our six foot trail, we also obviously have to protect uh, wood turtles. Right. Okay, we have Alex back. Thanks, Dave. Um, Alex, can we hear you on your computer at all? No, nope, still okay. can't hear him. Okay, I've got right. him on the phone still. All right. um, okay, so. well, um, I'm gonna take public comment. Um, Mike Lipinski, please go ahead. Welcome. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Yeah, uh, Mike Lipinski, uh, 167 Shoots Bay Road in Amherst. I've taken a lot of interest in the golf course project and, and uh, visited the site on many occasions. On two different occasions, on January 26th this year and on September 30th, there were situations on the site where the entire access road was under about two or three feet of water. And not only was it underwater, um, particularly in September, the um, a lot of the erosion controls were just overswept by the water. They were knocked down. The water was running freely over them. Um, and yet I haven't heard any mention of this flooding problem in any of the plans. And I'm concerned about that because that access road is in floodplain. And yet it doesn't seem to be an issue in any, in any of the discussion that I've heard. Um, along, along with that is the fact that um, 
I've also seen that water almost up to the top of the access road. So the access road they're planning to use to visit this site and on the September 30th date, the water was up to it and it may have actually overflowed it because that water tends to come up fast and it tends to recede fairly quickly. The concern is twofold. One, I'm wondering how that deals with the turtles if all the fencing and all the erosion controls are being washed away by this flooding. How does that affect this turtle plan? And the other thing that I think is a bigger concern is safety and if you have a situation with safety on the site where the fire department is expected to go out and deal with a, a, a flaming battery, for instance, and this flooding situation is taking place, there really is no access out there. Um, I will tell you that in the September event, the water was about three feet deep in the access road. And at that point, if you knew where the access road was, you could actually you could actually see the road. But if that situation had occurred at night, I find it hard to believe that the fire department would be able to go out there and find the road in the darkness if it's under three feet of water. Um, I think this is a serious concern for the site. I haven't heard of any remedy to it. Um, it's just that I guess when it floods, no one's going to cross that floodplain. But it, it's a, uh, I think it's something that should be addressed. I think it affects that turtle plan. And uh, I think it's something that should be looked into. Related to that, uh, another thing that was in place, and I'm not sure how critical it is, it looked like it was small detail. When they first uh, reinforced that bridge, they put some netting underneath it. I guess the netting was meant to, to capture broken pieces of concrete or something coming off. The, and of course, after the first flooding that occurred in January, something came along and just ripped that net down and it was hanging in the river and it was an obstacle. It's been removed ever since, but whatever purpose that net was supposed to serve, it no longer serves that purpose because it's just lying in a heap by the trailer, which happens to be in the floodplain that floods. So I'm not sure how that affects the conservation committee or not, but it's a reality of that situation at that site. And I really haven't heard it being addressed by the conservation committee or the ZBA for that, for that matter. So that's my public comment. Thank you, Mike. Um, so there, we are aware of the flooding um, and relevant to the, 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 um, road i mean sean or matt do you want to answer about you know the plans for flooding on the access road specifically yeah i mean and, we are where you know safety. it's in the flood 100 year flood plain and some of it's in the more frequent flood plain so it it you know it, it's going to occur uh you know as it does you know and uh it, it it's just part of it none of the critical infrastructure for the site is located within the flood zone um as it relates to the the turtle you know erosion controls and eternal monitoring um the erosion controls you know silt fences has been uh reinforced around the site um i i, I am aware of some you know uh areas that need to be repaired after certain rainfall events events and certain flood events and I, I will note that the site has been sub, it's subject to a, um, a construction general permit, which requires either weekly SWIP inspections or inspections after half an inch of rainfall, in, in which you know an inspector on behalf of the of Pure Sky is, goes out and inspects and uh, creates a remedy plan for any erosion controls that you know uh, need to be repaired. Um, in addition to that, the town has required a, a third party environmental monitor that's been going out there as well. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure what the duration uh, uh, of their visits is, but that's in addition to that. So we do have. There are a lot of eyes on the site from a professional standpoint that are looking into the erosion controls and if there's any, you know, uh, damage done during uh, high intensity rainfall rates or flood events that have been repaired. Um, I'm not aware of any kind of, you know, mass breaches or whatnot. Um, it seems like it held up fairly well uh, during the flood events. As it relates to the, the turtles, right, um, the turtle monitoring occurs during, um, you know, from 
uh, mid-April to mid-October. So during that time, we do have a, an, you know, a, a biologist out there, you know, making sure if any turtles get stuck inside the silt fence line are, are taken out of it. And that will only be during construction. Um, Matt, feel free to add in anything I, I may have missed here. Um, Thanks, Sean. As it, I, I did want to touch upon the netting, right? Um, so the netting was required um, as part of the uh, coordination with the building um, department. And the, the intent for the end of the project is to, um, you know, replace the, at least the, the, the top part of the, the flooring of the deck and, and kind of the guardrails. As part of that effort, um, you know, we would, we're required to put like netting underneath that. So during that demolition of the deck, any debris would be kept by the netting. The netting isn't really necessary during construction because um, there's a pretty thick, you know, there's a lot of erosion controls on the side of the bridge and the bridge has a pretty, um, doesn't really have a lot of gaps and there shouldn't be any um, sediment that are being tracked all the way down to the bridge. Um, uh, it's, it's mainly for demolition of the, of the deck, which is supposed to occur um, uh, later on in the project. So, you know, that can be, uh, you know, re replaced and repaired uh, prior to that work uh, and then taken down uh, upon completion. Thanks, Sean. Lawrence, I see your hand up. If you could make it quick, we'd really appreciate it. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll try and keep this as very quick as possible because I know this is much later than you anticipated. Um, the turtle barriers are to protect, uh, to uh, prevent the turtles from entering the active construction areas, which are outside of the floodplain. So the actual turtle barriers are not affected by the flooding because they kind of sit um, on the uh, uh, where the uh, where the site is. Um, the erosion controls that are around um, where the road has been done are a, a separate thing. They're not turtle barriers. It's tur the turtle barriers are the ones to uh, to keep them from the site. Um, uh, I think it's a valid uh, concern about being able to see that road in a flood um, situation. Um, perhaps the solution there is to add some markers along the road, that access road um, so that it, um, it's defined and they can come above the, the flood waters. So I think I'll, uh, I'll have a quick chat with the, the fire department before the next meeting um, and, uh, and see if we can update the plan to, to show some of those things on there as well. Great, thank you. Good, good point, Mike. And it sounds like we can incorporate some safety measures onto that with the flooding. Um, all right, Erin, I want to give you a chance to respond and then hopefully you can wrap this up. Yeah, so I just wanted to note that um, I did talk with the applicant about moving the construction trailer and any equipment um, out of the floodplain during construction, and they are, have committed to doing that. Um, as well, um, there is a, a flood mitigation area for the work that took place in the floodplain. Um, and just a quick note that the netting was supposed to be removed from the bridge um, when work on the bridge wasn't underway. I think that was just an oversight that it was left in place. Um, but when work resumes to um, uh, repair and redeck, et cetera, as noted by Sean, that that netting will have to be replaced. And and also it's been put on sliding, um, a sliding um, wire so that it, what's supposed to happen is that at the close of, of construction, at the end of the day, it gets pulled across so that it's not laying in the water. Um, it should only be under there if they're actually working on the, the bridge and debris is falling. So at the end of every work day, it's pulled back. Okay. That's good. All right, any further comments? Okay, seeing none, I think we're looking to continue, yes. All right, I'll move to continue the public hearing for 191, West Pomeroy, Fort River Solar LLC, notice of intent to 12, 13, 23 at 8, 10 p.m. Jason on the motion, I saw Bruce's hand up. I don't hear you, Bruce. Well, it's just that if you look at the list of things for the next meeting, it says 805. So does it matter, Aaron? It's all relative, apparently. All right. I, I think- yeah. I second it. It's your hand up, Matt. We'll get, okay, um, Bruce. 
A second. Jason or Bruce. I'm sorry. Hey. Aye. Jason. Aye. I'm an I. Alex. Okay. I heard the I. Okay. Moved. Oh, Matt, did you have a last comment? Just a quick request. Um, mm -hmm. given the time constraints that the project is under, we're hopeful that between now and the December 13th meeting, Aaron, you, me, and Sean, and Lawrence can work together to uh, not only address your comments, but ideally help craft a, a draft order of conditions. Yeah, I mean, we'll certainly do our best. Um, it's a complex project, and um, we have, as you can tell, nine hearings on the agenda, so I have, like, five or six orders of conditions I have to draft before the next meeting. So certainly that is the goal and I'll do my very best to accommodate. Um, I, I have to finish the revisions or finish the review and then we have to coordinate revisions as necessary um, and then take it from there. So, but you have my word that I will do my best to try to move it as, as promptly and efficiently as I possibly can. That's all we can ask for. I really appreciate it. It's just, it's just a bit of copy and paste, Aaron. I don't know what you're concerned about. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's let you have your evening or what's left of it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Lauren. Appreciate the Thank time, you, Matt. Thank, Thank you, you Sean. Much. Good night. Thank you. All right, commissioners. I think we're done. Yes. Okay. Well, with no further ado, looking for a motion to adjourn. Go out. Bruce on the motion, Jason on the second. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. I'm an I. Alex? <laughs> uh, I, I think we have good. I think we have good. <laughs> Unanimous. I say, Aaron, another, an another amazing job, you know, preparing for this meeting and making us all prepared and and looking good so thank you Aaron. yeah thank you for thank all you the preparation much. i, I want to encourage Aaron to put off anything that can be put off for if we are bothering her with things or you know and i we should discuss the question of whether to put off the land use um um subcommittee work right I mean, I could use more time, um, <laughs> but yeah, we'll keep us posted on your um, constraints and availability, Erin. And I Absolutely. think we can be probably flexible. Okay, um, Bruce, I you I assume you're taking minutes, so thank you. Um, as yes. I assume, hearing nothing else, I assume that what we're producing is uh, what people need. So Perfect. you're doing amazing, Bruce. I'm, I'm just so grateful. Hearing from, are they getting what they need though? <laughs> That's the question. So well, let me know if it's too much or too little. I'll do what I can. But. I mean, I, I think providing a link to the the YouTube video is also really great to cover anything that you feel like you might have missed or skimmed over. So well, I use the video to augment oh. what I write down. Yeah. Great. Well, and it's really helpful. That. Yeah. So, all right. Well, thank you everybody for your work. Sure. And okay. With that, good night. Good night. Bye, everybody. Thank, thank you. All. you. Have a great night. Bye.